Mic check. Mic check zero one. Yo, today we're talking about games and these started on mainframes back in the day. But let me explain and I'm gonna take it right into your brains. We're gonna talk about the history of video games. <laughs> something that <laughs> something that those of you who are previous students of mine will have not um not noticed is that I started freestyle rapping to check my microphone. <laughs> I think I think it's important every now and then to show that lecturers are not uh, not necessarily the gods of all knowledge, and there are some things that we're really bad at. Um, and so I'm going to continue doing that by programming in front of people. <laughs> Sorry, I mean uh, <laughs> freestyle rapping. Um, oh, Michael, you say Beats by Dr. Chi. There was. There was actually like the assignment CS beats that we used once in one five one one, that turned into beats by beats by CSE, but it was actually like my first name for it was beats by Mark G because I was being an idiot. Oh, Alex is 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 dropping Alexander's dropping in with some some old school reference there, old dirty Mark, get your get your Wu Tang Clan on, thirty seventh chamber of Shaolin, very cool. Oh, Mark Face Killer. Wow, you really, really getting on the, um, getting on the Wu-Tang there. But, I mean, like, obviously, obviously, Wu-Tang Clan. One of the most important rap groups in history. Um, anyway. <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay. Um, I mean, I can be pretty chill with this today, because last time I gave this talk, it was about an hour long. I've added a slide recently. Um, <laughs> are we just... Cheezer, we're, we're just, we're just putting my name into, I'm going to wait for chat to, to basically go through all of the members of the Wu-Tang Clan one by one. <laughs> but there's two Cheezers there though. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to actually talk over talk about. Okay. So Mike asked me on behalf of CSE Sock a little while ago, it was like, Mark, can you give some talks? that people in CSE Sock might be interested in. And so I've got a bunch of things and it's always really funny because it's like, well, we'll do it in week six. Uh, Alex, stop. <laughs> Sorry, if anyone doesn't know, Alex is just literally going through the Wu-Tang Clan members and putting my name in there somewhere. Um, this is a talk I put together in 2019. Actually, I think I put this together in 2018 and then I redid it in 2019 and then redid it again in uh, just recently, just the other day, um, because uh, Michael was asking me about uh, giving talks for, for CSE Socks, because I think it's really good to do these things. We get together and we talk about interesting things. And I have a few lined up that are on more kind of serious programming things, but then I thought it'd be fun to do this talk, especially because I was really busy this term. And so I said to Michael here, why don't I give you one that I've already written my own script for? So I don't have to do any prep time. And this one's also really, really near and dear to my heart because um, I'm, I'm repping, I'm even repping with a t-shirt today. Um, the history of video games is really interesting. Uh, and, you know, we're all, we're all living in it. So I'm just going to assume most likely that everyone who's here hanging out today is probably someone that either plays a lot of games or are interested in games, maybe interested in developing games and stuff like that. So I think this is a... This is a fun thing. So um, some of the uh, uh, some of the rationale behind me creating this was just so that I could um, I could talk about the games that I love. There's a fair bit of uncredited imagery <laughs> in these slides, so I think at one stage I will put together a credit list for every single game that I've put in these slides. It'll be really long. Probably won't even go into these slides because there's there's so many of them. Um, some of them are vitally important. Um, some of them are entirely biased because <laughs> some of them are like, there's like really good examples of this genre, but this is the one that I played and I liked the most, so he gets to go in. So please don't take this as, oh, well, actually, actually, if your favorite game doesn't make it uh, into the brief history of video games, feel free to get really, really angry on the internet about it and stuff. <laughs> Because because it'll just be funny. Um, yeah, but take it with a pinch of salt. But sometimes I'm going to lean towards things that I experienced personally. Uh, 
but please take in the joy from that because I think that's what games are all about. The games are about personal experiences and, and the joy of, of, of having the games. Oh, Miguel's here because it was 151. Because I told people in, um, in 1511 about it. Sam saying Mark personally designed Mario confirmed. You know, Mario might not be in the slides. There might be no photos of Mario. Now that I think about it, that is such a huge omission. I'm pretty sure Zelda's in there, though. I mean, Legend of Zelda. Zelda herself is, like, ironically not that important in Zelda games. Okay. So, um, Sam is saying surely TF2 gets its own 10-minute segment. TF2 gets a segment. It's not a good one, though, but it's in. You'll see when we get there. Okay, so let's, let's take a little stroll through time. So, time travel always a wonderful thing um it's easier if we start back in time and come back to the present uh, much easier than going to the future also chances are we won't necessarily change anything about history here so we're going to look at the history of computers and how games fit into that we are actually going to flat out ignore a significant part of the history of computers because it doesn't always have relevance to um to games so there's the whole you know that massive thing that just appeared in the mid 90s the internet like we're not even really talking about the internet i mean like it was very very significant but i'm going to talk about why that made certain games significant when we get there and you know and there's obvious things that were like basically made for gaming like the introduction of vr and we'll talk about that as well so we're looking at some of the historical moments we're going to step through the decades there are lots of them because we can consider video games beginning kind of around the 50s and 60s not at the level that they're at now. I think the level that we're at now is something where if we wanted to, we could start in the 70s and the 80s instead if we wanted to. But I think it's important to think about how we got to any of that as well. Um, oh, Kai said, if Super Smash Brothers Melee for the Nintendo GameCube doesn't make it here, I will lose my mind. That is very, very specific. And I don't think it's in talk. <laughs> Nintendo's obviously mentioned. <laughs> I love it. I love how many people are just like, I want this game in this. You know, I've only got one hour. I've got one hour to talk about 70 years of game development. So let's get into it. We're going to go from the very beginning. So I mentioned this in the wrap at the beginning, mainframes. So mainframes are, I mean, like you could even say that mainframes kind of still exist to a certain extent. The idea of having a, a room full of computers um, that, that do some significant amount of processing work. It's interesting that we moved away from that and we moved a lot of computing power into like personal computers and stuff like that. And nowadays we're kind of moving back to that idea with stuff like AWS, like Amazon compute cluster and stuff like that. So back in the day, there was no networking. Like I know it's like crazy to think that there was no networking. So it was just the computer itself. So games were used just to show the capability of computers. And so at this point, in 1950, it was a big deal to have a computer that would play tic-tac-toe against you. And, and I think that's important to think about because of how trivial we think tic-tac-toe is. So we, we think of tic-tac-toe as like just this, like, you know, like you can solve tic-tac-toe in your head. Like, it's that simple that the human cognitive limit of it is, is like, we can actually just be 100% be at tic-tac-toe like we can 100% force a draw in tic-tac-toe all the time just by looking at the board and thinking about it carefully and so that was actually amazing that a computer could do that in 1950 so this is birdie the brain and as you can see and i think this is a really good photo because there is a human in the photo for scale and that is the size of the machine and they've got a glass panel here showing some of the processing parts and stuff and so like i don't know how many iphones we could fit in this box here, but like you're talking about the space that, that we would take up the space of several thousand normal computers for this thing to just be able to play tic-tac-toe and it can't even do anything else it just plays tic-tac-toe but that's where we are at 1950 and I think that's still very important because this is um, the first point at which we see that computers and games fit together computers and games can like games can be used to show the capability of computers um, 
Trey is asking me to tell Tom he needs to play Skyrim. I don't think I want to tell Tom to play Skyrim. I need Tom to play Run 1511 in the background while I'm talking about computer games. <laughs> okay, moving on to the 1960s. Oh, uh, William said only a month till Cyberpunk. I 100% agree. I actually have some leave saved up this year, and so I will be disappearing for a week, and I'm calling it my Cyberpunk 27-7 holiday. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. So when we move from the 50s to the 60s, computers start getting cheaper. Um, one of the important things that happens at this point is they shrink. And they shrink enough that we can get several computers of the same models in lots of different places in the world. Um, someone develops this game called Space War. Um, you can kind of see it here. Like, have a look at the, the, how primitive this screen is. Oh, you can see the reflection of all the, the people in it. I never looked that closely at the screen. But you can see the trails. Um, so this is how slow the kind of refresh rate is, like how long it takes for these pixels to return back to black after being coloured. It's super, super slow. But it still kind of worked, and so Space War is a game with kind of, I think, like a gravity well in the middle, and you just kind of orbit that gravity well and shoot at each other. Um, and that's all it is. Um, but I think it's really, really significant because this is in the 1960s. Um, Space War was released in 1962. I mean, I say released, but I mean, like, no one sold this. This is like high-end computing research labs that weren't even called computing research labs then because computing wasn't a thing. Um, computing was a thing that some mathematicians and electrical engineers were doing in their in their side side hobbies and starting to watch well, it was more than hobbies but there wouldn't have been a computing school at UNSW in 1962 so if there were these computers at, um, at UNSW it would have been mathematicians thinking about um, doing things with them or um, electrical engineers thinking about how to design uh, miniaturized machines and things like that so we get at that get to that point but we get a game that people start passing around so we, we've got something that can go on um, on data storage I don't know what data storage they were using in the 60s I'm thinking tape drive stuff but honestly don't know enough about it I also wasn't born in the 60s so this isn't one of those times where I'm just gonna flex that I'm older than most of you and then talk about a particular era wait till we get to the 90s and I start getting really obnoxious we'll, we'll get there but we'll get there the beauty of space war is it started getting passed around um, different research labs so there were multiple research labs in different places playing this game and this is great because like you think about this these people now are like I don't know in their 70s or 80s and some of them are going to be professors of of computing and stuff like that but we all started out in the same place we all started out uh, abusing the technology that's been provided for us as students in order to entertain ourselves so did I ever tell you about the time that I installed the arcade machine emulator on the lab machines and then made that available to all the other students in CSE? I probably shouldn't have told you about that. <laughs> We're not in Comp 1511 right now. I'm just someone giving a talk, so I'm going to talk about that. Anyway, <laughs> I got in a little bit of trouble over that, but it wasn't actually that bad. I didn't get in that much trouble. I deleted it pretty quickly. But the coolest thing here is the first ever computer games tournament it happens 10 years later in 1972. Um, it's funny, right? Ten years. And we think that stuff moves moving slower back then. Um, g'day, Abraham. Oh, hi to everyone else as well. <laughs> but um, this tournament had, I think, about, it was about 30 or 40 people got together, and they played this game against each other. And, um, and it's great, because this is the beginning of what was eventually going to become something very important to us, as as computer game people is the idea that we can have competitive computer games and we can like um, play games against each other and stuff and we can set this thing up and then like we could say that the rise of esports was from all the way back in 1972 so I think that's really cool then something happens the first the first giant of computer gaming appears and that is a company called Atari so in, it was actually even before the 1970s, I think, that um, uh, Atari appeared and they started uh, looking at um, 
computer games as things that could be put into pinball parlors at the time. So we think about um, <laughs> people saying Rip Atari and the ET landfill. We are going to we're going to talk about that. That's very very important in the history of Atari. Um, but this game here. A lot of people think of this as the first computer game. It's not necessarily true. This is probably the first computer game. Or you could consider this to be the first computer game. But either way, when Pong happens, that is the point at which computer games begin to change the world. So at this point, the Pong arcade machine, and like nowadays, we just look at this and go, oh my god, it's so simple. It's like literally two little things that go up and down. It's like just like a, a really, really poor simulation of tennis. But it's a massive hit. Um, so people are dropping their quarters into these quarters. I love saying stuff like that. So there used to be a coin. Actually, it still exists. I mean, like, people don't use them as much as they used to. But um, dropping quarters into this um, to play a game with their friends. Um, and it's a really simple game, but it begins something. And I think that's the most important thing about this, is uh, Pong is the first arcade game, uh, the first arcade machine. And in 1972, this is a really big deal. And the fact that we're looking at like 50 years later now, uh, gaming arcades still exist. Like you can go into the city and go to time zone, you know? Um, so you can play the same kind of um, format of, um, of games as these original ones. So Atari begins by making um, arcade games, but then we get into the 80s. And so the 80s is where, um, is where games kind of explode. Um, and this is where a lot of, a lot of what we have now in the future um, of this is, is set up at this point in time. So this is what we call the golden age of the arcade. And this is the point where we set a precedent. I say we because I'm very kind of like, I'm just like, this is us, you know? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put us, us, <laughs> as computer games against other industries <laughs> in this. And the first, this is the first point. And this is a lot earlier than people think it is. So if I say to you now that the revenue from computer games like, if we just look at something, say, America, for example, but it's not just America, it's the whole world. If I say the revenue from cu computer games is more than the revenue from the entire music and film industries put together, so, um, I'm just wondering if that's the same in Korea, because Korea's got a massive music industry now, but it also has the biggest games industry, so it might even still be the case. Um, if I say that to you now, you're like, yeah, of course. Like, we can't have all those microtransactions and not have billions of dollars going into, like, Blizzard Activision's hands. <laughs> but we're going to get onto that later as well. But this happened in 1982, which is really full on when you think that the only way that the arcade games were making money is people were physically going up to them and putting coins in them. I mean, at the same time, the only way to see a film was to physically go to a theater and stuff. So, so we're not, it's not online games competing against Netflix, um, which is still beating. But this, at this point was um, people physically going to arcades and playing them. And some of these games here are like absolute classics. And you see like, I, I picked up a set that span a whole, a whole decade here. This actually goes through a crash that happens in the industry, but even through that, there were still these massive games. So, Space Invaders, super, super cool. Um, this is a game and a style that still exists. Um, Space Invaders was the the progenitor of the uh, of the shmup, they call it the shoot 'em up games. Um, we've got some absolute classics like Pac-Man as well. And then some really kind of important ones for later on, like Gauntlet and Double Dragon, that sort of introduced this um, idea of like uh, co-op multiplayer, even and that, and you can see where that's ended up now, right? That's that's huge as well. So um, this is actually not a photo from then. This is a like a kind of a present day photo um, of a um, of of a museum that keeps all of this stuff. <laughs> 
I love. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm just like loving the um the chat because every now and then I'm looking over and like apparently I personally invented games. I'm I'm okay with that. I've personally invented like I don't know two or three games in my life. That's all. I my, the the time I spent in game dev was 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 very short and I never did it professionally. And Deadly Fugu was saying, imagine physically going places. Yeah, I know. I know, and I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. I didn't cause the pandemic. But um, we were joking about the reasons why we caused the pandemic. And apparently it's because I was doing all this live streaming lecturing and I started saying that live streaming was superior to live lectures. And now everyone has to do it. <laughs> oh, Dean, 343 killed Halo. I just recently went back and played Halo Reach. And I just want to say that cinematic first-person shooters were perfected in 2011, and everything after that's worthless. <laughs> just want to... <laughs> Sorry. So, sometimes I'd like to throw a spicy treat in there like that. <laughs> but, but oh my god, how good is Halo Reach? It is just like a pinnacle of... Nathan is saying, how about Doom? Okay, yes. Doom I don't necessarily consider to be like a cinematic space opera shooter. I think it's a slightly different thing. But id Software is going to come up later. Okay, okay. <laughs> I love the conversation. We're, we're going to have like a, just a chill conversation at the end of this where we talk about all this kind of stuff. Um, but I just love where everyone's going because a lot of this stuff is going to come up as we go along. So, 1980s were massive. This is the first time this shift happens. So, we go from being niche and being like just in research labs and stuff like that, to being the primary earning form of entertainment in the world. Um, maybe not the whole world, but at least at this point in the US, because it moved in the US first. So these kinds of things happen. And then, I have to remember which slide is next. Yeah, I thought this slide was, I was gonna segue into this slide, but I had to make sure it was gonna be this slide. Then, what happens next is Atari says, could we, could we build an arcade machine that we can sell some on the arcade machine and we can change the software in the arcade machine so that it can play multiple different games? They only had four games at this time in 1977. So I think they had Pong, Space Invaders. I want to say Pac-Man, but I don't think it was. I don't think Pac-Man came across until there was some dodgy stuff that went on with Ms. Pac-Man instead of Pac-Man. That was the uh, slight copyright infringement legal case that went on there. Funny story, um, this comes later, but there's a person called Kirby in Nintendo who was actually the lawyer that helped Nintendo America get around a lawsuit. Um, I think it was based on Pac-Man. But anyway, so... The Atari Video Computer System. This, this machine. I would love to actually physically get the machine and show it to you, but I don't have it here. It's at my parents' place from years and years ago. Well, I mean, it stopped working in the 80s because I played it too much. Um, but this was also called the Atari 2600. Later, it was renamed to the Atari 2600. Um, this is the first console. Actually, it's not the first console. There were other kind of consoles, but this is the first one that gets massive widespread appeal. One of the things that it gets um, importantly is versions of arcade hits. So uh, Space Invaders and Pac-Man were those. Adventure is another game entirely. Adventure is a very, very famous game. Um, it's, I don't know if you would call it the first story-based adventure game, maybe the first RPG. It's hard because our current genres don't fit. And imagine getting to call a game adventure. Imagine there being so few games that you can just go, oh yeah, adventure. <laughs> this entire concept is the name of the game. So absolute classic. Um, and, and at this point, things start getting big, things start bubbling, right? So um, the Atari video, games, uh, video computer system becomes the thing that you need to buy at Christmas that year. You know, like, I don't think this happens very much anymore where every year at Christmas there's like one toy, which is the toy that everyone must have. So in the late 70s, this was the video computer system. And I just wanted like a little, little bit of uh, 
uh, a side note here. At some point, there was like an argument between some of the programmers at Atari, and so they said, no, nah, that's it. We're going to go off and do our own thing. So we don't want to work under Atari, but we'll be a third-party publisher for the company. And they formed a company called Activision. So this was a couple of people in a garage <laughs> formed Activision. And so, yes, we may know that Activision is still active today, might be the biggest game corporation in the world. I don't know whether they or EA is bigger right now. I haven't done all my research on that, but yeah. Um, just checking what people are saying in chat. Oh, Nathan said your parents used to have one of those as well. Yep. Dean saying, is Adventure the one in the recent movie? Yes, Adventure is the one referenced in Ready Player One. Ready Player One is very, very, um, um, very, very much paying homage to this era, the, the golden age of gaming, as they call it. Um, the book more so than the movie. The movie kind of goes, okay, not just that, but let's, let's, let's go further into history and all the other different kinds of gaming that happened. Okay, so this is like the birth of the consoles. This is the idea that now people are no longer going to the arcade. People are forking out um, money for this system to be in their home. I can't remember the exact numbers, but roughly, and this will be really interesting to you for, for purchasing consoles nowadays. Like if anyone's already thinking about buying the um, PS5 and stuff like that, the Atari 2600 if we adjust its price for inflation and you were to buy it today, I think they said it was roughly 800 US dollars, which in Australian dollars is over a thousand dollars for this thing, and yet it sold heaps. Uh, so the, the, the funny thing I guess about that is how much we're willing to spend on gaming machines is, is, is still the same. It's, <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Um, the other thing that happens, and so this will begin the eternal struggle, which is still happening with no clear winner, is are PCs or consoles better? Because at the same time PCs appear, and this is the Commodore 64, and it has this hilarious record of being the best-selling single computer model of all time. Um, and that, um, that kind of doesn't mean anything, because <laughs> like... If you consider every single laptop or PC that you can be build, can build to be a model, then they're all different. Because, I mean, how many of us use exactly the same motherboard, exactly the same graphics card, and exactly the same CPU? But this one gets this because it's from the era where, like, you build a computer, and that's it. That's the computer. You don't modify it. You can't do anything else with it. You just get your Commodore 64. And it ran for long enough that... Um, it, uh, it sold so many that it's, it's just become ubiquitous as like this classic. Um, and there were so many funny things about the Commodore 64. Like sometimes you had to actually load the game onto the Commodore 64 with a cassette tape. So I don't know if that's going back too far in time. <laughs> it's a tape used for storing music. And if you played that tape in a music player, you would actually hear the code. So you'd hear the, the, the modulation of the frequency that was saying whether there were zeros or ones. Um, which is pretty boring to listen to. Um, but the thing also would literally take three minutes to, to, to load a game, or even more than that, depending on the size of the game. You could be sitting there for 20 minutes while this thing loaded into your 64K of memory. That's it. You only had 64K of memory, and it could still take you half an hour to load the game in. Um, but the important thing that we're getting here is we have this thing now. Because one of the things the Commodore 64 was there for, it wasn't just a gaming machine, it was there to be a computer for people to use for business. So it had a full keyboard. Um, full keyboard means um, we now have many, many more keys, but they're in a slightly different layout than how we would expect something in a gamepad or a controller. So suddenly we get a new genre based on the idea of a keyboard. And that genre was text-based games. So if you ever played these games where they just like, they just have text and you say like, move north or move west or something and you go to this next location and they explain it to you. I always as a kid found these really funny because there was always pictures on the box. There was box art with these wonderful images of where you'd be and then when you played the game there was no art. It was all text <laughs> and you're like where's where's these these images that you said were gonna happen and it's like oh 
They have to happen in your head. Oh. <laughs> Strangely enough, I went really, really deep into um, computer graphics after that because <laughs> I just wanted to see the things. Um, Sydney was saying, heard of a lot of programmers first hit PC being a Commodore 64. Yeah, a lot of programming happened in the Commodore 64 because it was one of the first things that put the computer into your home. That, and I think like the Apple II, Apple I, Apple II, around that era as well. Um, as Michael saying, it would also then birth mechanical keyboard and enthusiasts, loud rattling noises. Yeah. Um, and Miguel saying, hang on, is the computer literally inside the keyboard? Yes. This is the whole computer and there's a plug on the back that you can plug it into your TV so that you get a screen. Yeah, and it just goes into a TV because back then, that's all we had. Um, because the idea that the computer would have a different kind of display to something that was already in people's homes was preposterous. Like, who would buy something like that? <laughs> funny, funny, right? So the other thing that happens as well is the IBM PC compatible. So this is where we start diverging in PC. So the IBM had a personal computer and then everyone else started making personal computers that were compatible with IBM specification. Um, that is the PC that we have today. So um, if anyone ever says that your, your laptop is a, an IBM compatible laptop, <laughs> it doesn't entirely make sense anymore, but that was what the current line of laptops was based on was um, IBM came up with a spec for a personal computer and then everyone else followed it. And so I think for a lot of people, that was the beginning of computers going into homes. This is happening roughly around the mid eighties at this point. Um, the mid eighties were a time where people were starting to actually buy computers and put them in their homes. The IBM PC compatible at that time would be roughly around the idea of spending say three four thousand dollars on a computer so this is adjusted um so if you were doing that then you were you were keen you were you were an early adopter and you were looking into the future of where these things were going to be but that still meant it was in a lot of homes and was commercially available so when we talk about the entry of japan into um into video games one of the funniest things, I think, is that we think that Japan invented video games um, because of their, just the sheer level of domination they have over video games these days. They actually entered this to enter into the American market. So the funny thing is the rise of Nintendo was actually because of Nintendo America rather than Nintendo Japan. Nintendo Japan was making these things, but this box here, this super famous box as like, you know, we can think of this as like the symbol of computer gaming. This Nintendo Entertainment System was designed for the American market. It doesn't even look like that in Japan. Um, like if everyone's seen the, um, the Nintendo Famicom, the, the family computer that they had, that this is like the American version of, um, it's got the, this kind of pastel pink uh, magenta kind of colors and it's like got rounded bits on it and stuff so it's like it's very very different but the thing that gets japan into america gets them into this big rich market that's already into computer games is the famous 1983 american games industry crash so people were already referencing this um when they were when we were talking about this earlier um that atari there was a whole series of things that happened um Atari got too big for their boots. They thought that they were bigger than they were. They started making more consoles than they could sell. I mean, let's not, let's not sell them short, all right? The Atari 2600, in its lifespan, sold 30 million consoles at a time where the idea that everyone has a games console didn't even exist. So they sold 30 million consoles at a time where they were new and different. That's massive. The only problem is they they kind of over predicted what they thought they would sell around 1983. And so they started making more than the market needed. And so they had warehouses full of these things. Um, and they 
uh, got in a partnership with Warner Brothers, the massive movie company, and said, let's do some movie tie-ins. <laughs> and this is the famous one, right? Everyone already kind of know it. We kind of talk, talked about this earlier. There's a game called E.T. <laughs> E.T. is the first example of someone making a mistake um, based on uh, compromising the quality of a game for a release date. And I find it deeply, deeply ironic how common this still is when it nearly tanked the entire video game industry. It nearly destroyed the video game industry. People in 1983 were talking about um, the video games being a fad that went for a few years and would fade away and people would go to other forms of entertainment. They thought there was an industry that was going to disappear entirely. And we had the risk of that nearly happening because someone said, make a game of the E.T. movie and please finish it by Christmas. And so 1983 Christmas was a disastrous time for Atari. This was like nearly all about Atari at this point. They say the American games industry crashed, but since Atari was such a big part of the industry at that point, it was really just about them. Too many consoles, too many competitors making too many consoles that were similar at this point. Because when you consider the Atari 2600, or the video computer system, as it was then, had been going here for six years, right? So there were a lot of other competitors. There were too many. Uh, shops saw that um, the quality of games and also the sheer number of games available was getting really high and it was hard to tell which games are good or not. Gee, is that a problem that's still around today? Anyway, <laughs> right? We hit this point where shops stop ordering from Atari. So Atari has too much stuff. They can't sell it. They can't pay for the stuff they've made. They go into debt. Everything goes really bad. Um, so there's the famous thing of the the landfills full of um, ET cartridges because the game was so unpopular that they just never sold how many they made. Um, yeah, and people are saying in... Um, in chat, crunch is bad, crunch is bad, yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. I like that comment from Deadly Fugu there. Uh, EA, nearly destroyed the industry, mm, takes notes. Yeah, that's exactly what. I mean, I think I, I talk around EA in this talk and I never mention them entirely because I don't really want to give them time, although I keep talking about them. Because every time I talk about a mistake in the computing, uh, in, in the gaming industry, I'm kind of talking about EA. Okay, okay. Nintendo's not alone. I, contrary to my own heart and soul, I decided to be objective here and put the Nintendo Entertainment System here and not put Sega. Which is really weird because I grew up with Sonic the Hedgehog and the Sega Master System, which was, sorry, Sega Mega Drive. Um, Master System, I didn't even have a Master System, but like the Mega Drive is like a big deal to me. But having said that, I know and I understand that the NES is, is the main point. Having said that, Nintendo vs Sega sets up a rivalry for the ages. So this thing goes for quite a few years, the Nintendo vs Sega thing. Um, and the beauty of it is it starts the first console war. And we love the console wars because the console wars have been going continuously since this point in time so i think the the master system would be around 84 85 they were just a year or two behind uh, the entertainment system but in this time in these console wars nintendo creates things that will resonate through the history of computer games in such a huge way Mario and the Legend of Zelda are created in that era. And, I mean, like, should point out, Mario was technically around earlier in Donkey Kong when he was called Jump N, but um, when, when he gets named and when he, when he takes the, the spotlight at that point is, is in this era with the, the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Sega, a few years later, with the second generation of these consoles, the Mega Drive creates Sonic the Hedgehog. Again, something that resonates through the eras. Not quite as much. This is why Nintendo gets the picture here. Nintendo sets themselves up at this point as the company for games. And one would, I think, be able to argue that... 
if there is only one company making computer games in the world, it is Nintendo. You know, if we had to, if we had to throw away all the other companies making games and say, which company is the most committed to games, the most reliable, uh, and the most likely to be worth it to us if we had to destroy all other companies than one, then Nintendo is the one that would survive. And it's crazy that they were around in their 80s and they have survived everything that's happened since then. And I would say the other innovations they've made are things like they released the Game Boy in 1989. So they said, you can chuck some batteries in this little box and you can have your games and you can have them on the go. This was like the bane of primary school teachers. (laughs) <laughs> probably high school teachers as well the world over this device like this was this was me in primary school at this at this time and it was amazing um the fact that you could then take it with you and play it anywhere this was something that was unheard of uh previously and it spawned the idea that gaming on the go was a thing we're going to talk about mobile gaming later as well the introduction, introduction of the smartphone brought us back into the same kind of fever pitch of the first era of the Game Boy. Um, so I think it's quite funny because I'm not even a um, I'm not even a huge Nintendo fan. Like I have, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest here. I have never finished a Mario game. Um, I think I've only finished one Zelda game, the Super Nintendo Zelda. I've never. Oh, I can't say that. I was going to say I've never owned a Nintendo console, but I was given a 3DS. No, it wasn't a 3DS, a DS Lite, and now I've got a Nintendo Switch. Um, because now I can afford things, so I buy more stuff. But back in the day, I was not a Nintendo person, so I was on the other side of the fence. The loser side. <laughs> okay, okay. Anyway, so the 80s, yeah, this is that, that was like super important. That was a massive development. Things got big, but things fell apart. Other things came in, and, and that was really cool. But then we hit the 90s and we enter the third dimension. So I just like this. Like, I'm talking about time travel and, like, multiple dimensions and stuff like that. So the 90s are also very, very important for for, um, computer gaming. So this is really funny. You'll see this. Every decade gets more time in it. So I went over the 50s and 60s really quickly, right? 70s, more stuff happened. 80s, more stuff happened. 90s, much more stuff happened. We've got a mouse now. The 90s are where this interesting peripheral that I can't remember which company released the mouse first. I think it may have been the Apple Macintosh. Um, But what we get here is point and click games start appearing on PC. And so there's a few of these that are um, some of these, again, like pretty much every game that I'm going to talk about in this talk is going to have some resounding impact on the game industry because like if it doesn't then in this brief talk i really don't have time to talk about it right so secret of monkey island absolute classic right this spawns this um point and click series that is well actually no it doesn't spawn it it's actually the probably the most famous example of it but it was actually uh what was called hero's quest um back in the day before they got sued by games workshop um that's another thing. Oh, you want to you want to like get into like the crossover between computer games and board games? That's like where my expertise lies. But we're not talking about that today. That's why it became Quest for Glory instead. They just went, oh look, why don't we just back off? Because these board gaming giants are still much bigger than us at this point in time. Um, but this is where we see this genre appear and take off. All of these quest games, uh, Heroes Quest, Space Quest, Police Quest, and stuff like that. Uh, Leisure Suit Larry is actually technically part of the Quest series. Um, is that the first porno game? I don't know. I don't think Leisure Suit Larry is the first one. I think in the 80s there were like really, really hilariously low pixel count strip poker games and stuff. <laughs> Very silly. Um, they have no right to be part of this conversation of history of video games they're like largely unimportant um i'm just going back through chat yeah michael was asking you if i had a switch yes yes so i was saying like i'm still not that much a nintendo person because ironically i bought a switch but i still play more games on my pc than on the switch um but current someone's mentioning animal crossing we're going to talk about that 
I have a special section for 2020 because 2020 is roughly a decade long as well. But anyway, okay, the introduction of the mouse and Mist is an absolute classic. Think about all of the best puzzle games that exist nowadays. Ah, think of like, well, a good example of that is The Witness. Um, it's a game based on this idea of like going around this island and solving puzzles and things and that idea is from 1993. And I th I'm pretty sure, I don't know, I'm just guessing that um, Jonathan Blow 100% knows that. Um, and that's why the setting of The Witness is what it is. It's like saying, remember this? This was the pinnacle of puzzle games. And we want you to have the same feeling. So we want to bring you back to that same world. Um, <laughs> Sid's saying Jonathan Blow will never admit to it. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, yeah. Oh, someone was also talking about Among Us. Yeah, the 2020 section is basically just Animal Crossing and Among Us. Spoiler for later. So the mouse gets used for games, and this is super interesting, because at the beginning, the mouse gets used exactly how a mouse gets used. You click on documents and stuff and things. So, so everything's like kind of static with point and click, um, which is cool, right? But there's more that the mouse can be used for. And yes, this is it. 1996, 1996, you, you, you can't, this, I can't even speak anymore thinking about 1996 because I was there as a teenager. So this was like, this was amazing. This was like, so two things happened in 1996, two things happened in 1996, which indelibly make their mark on the entire computing game, computing games industry, and they change everything forever. So, this little company called id Software, they're not that little at this point, because they've had success with Wolfenstein 3D and Doom, and Doom 2, but they released Quake. Quake is the first game where a programmer called John Carmack um, releases a game that has his new system that he's put together. He's not alone in this, right? There were other researchers doing it, but he was the first person to actually genuinely release this using a system called polygon rendering. Uh, and this is the first three-dimensional game. There's other games that have a kind of a pseudo 3D effect, usually his games previously, like Doom 2. Um, people think of Doom 2 as being 3D. It's actually not 3D. It's really interesting um, because the Doom series is a two-dimensional game. So it's a, a two-dimensional map with a height, um, a height uh, value for every location. So you, you, you probably have never noticed this about Doom, but if you go in and you play it and you look for it, you will notice you can never find a situation where there are two platforms above each other where you can walk on one or on the other. So everything only has a single height. So it's not fully 3D, but Quake is fully 3D. The other thing that has happened here, so I'm talking like between 1992, 1995, a whole bunch of people start buying modems, going online, the internet appears. And so that's what I was saying, I didn't even talk about the internet appearing. Because the internet appearing is, yes, very important for games, but what it's important is Quake becomes the first um, game to use this protocol. I actually don't think it was the first game. It was definitely the first shooter to do this. Well, I mean like it was nearly the first shooter, full stop. But it was the first online first person shooter. And we think about how many games at the moment are online first person shooters. Like, I don't know, what are we like 30, 40% of the number of games released are in some form an online first person shooter. Quake invents that. So the term deathmatch was id software's name for throwing a bunch of people get together in a first person shooter environment getting to shoot each other until they all die right um it was the first shooter to use the tcp ip protocols this new thing that had just been made for communication between computers i love it because we just take it for granted now tcp ip is just this backbone of the internet um but back then it was like oh this is new can we actually hook into this and it's like yes they did and so quake is like absolutely revolutionary in that case. Um, it is the game that sort of spawns the majority of competitive gaming that happens now. Funnily enough, in 1996, it's the other genre 
that spawns the other side of competitive gaming as it is right now um, starts to get really big. So in 1996, this little company called Blizzard, a couple of people, again, a couple of people in a garage. We look at it now and it's like, how many billions of dollars do those couple of people have now? They make a game called Warcraft. Um, and I picked this, 1996, even though Warcraft is not the game that invented the genre. It's not even the game that I think was the biggest at the time for this genre. That is undoubtedly uh, Westwood's Command and & Conquer. And the game Dune 2 was the game that I, I would say invented real-time strategy. So invented the idea of top-down, placing buildings, building units, going off and having a fight, um, having Uber Micro, you know, that kind of stuff. Is that okay if I say Uber Micro? I think that's pretty old, that reference. But anyway, um, this game for Blizzard becomes super, super important for all of our future <laughs> in games. It's this kind of third wave of fantasy where we get, like, you know, the Tolkien fantasy, which is, like the 50s and the second wave of fantasy is the um dungeons and dragons and warhammer level of fantasy like directly following from tolkien but later on 70s 80s and this is the third wave where it's like we're influenced by all of this stuff in the past and we bring it to a new medium um obviously not the first game to do that but probably one of the most important ones to to push and so we've got this this is why i love this slide so much right because two genres get blasted into um, into prominence. The RTS and the first-person shooter, they become nearly the blueprint for all successful games that follow. Not only that, they have this wonderful kind of difference between what this kind of dark sci-fi feel is going to be, and it's going to be in so much stuff in the future, and what this kind of high fantasy, um, you know, orcs versus humans and magic and all this kind of stuff is going to be and that's going to get carried through into so much stuff into the present day so i think i see this as a really really important point in time for gaming and for anyone here who wants to get in a fight and an argument this is like a really really good point to um uh to talk about um uh what's gonna call it uh let's let's say that like all of this stuff is happening on the pc right now so we can say that like this is where the pc steps up and raises its head and says i am a gaming machine you know and so up until this point there's a lot of stuff on the pc but at, at this point the, the consoles are kind of shaking in their boots because they cannot do these kinds of games and these kinds of games suddenly get really really popular um <laughs> Someone's saying, how many garages do people have now? I mean, like, when you think about it, um, I've, got, I've got friends now who are making, mostly, like, when you start off as an indie nowadays, you make phone games, because it's easier to get games out on phone. It's easy to kind of turn it around. You don't have to go through full-on publishing deals and stuff like that. Um, it's the same kind of thing. I had friends who, who tried to make an indie game. What they do is they rented a house. And so five of them lived in this house together and they just like lived there and worked on the game in the house and they tried to just do it really intense. That one never got released, but I got other friends that like happily got releases out and stuff like that. So a lot of it is just like that. You know, it's just a couple of people getting together with a cool idea and then seeing where we go. Um, William H said Ice Frog and Dota. Yeah, so this is how Dota appears, right? Uh, Dota was a mod of Warcraft 3 so I remember playing it when it was just like a... It was a custom map. You just downloaded the custom map and played it. Um, and so it was really funny because you download different custom maps and someone's added some cheats in there. And so one of the characters is really powerful and your friend just happens to play that character all the time. It was, it was fun, that, fun times. And Dota 2 is where they said, okay, let's lock this thing down and actually make it its own thing. Um, <laughs> Alex says, does multiple garages increase your chance to be a billionaire? <laughs> Definitely. And undoubtedly so. Um, so you have one garage for making indie games. Uh, you have another garage for doing uh, VFX for film. Um, you've got another garage to release dumb apps that um, drunk people like to download and use. Um, I'm trying to think about another... You've got another garage where you're publishing your um, underground comic slash TV series. 
Um, or you have like my room here where you're just streaming and you're trying to make money out of your, your garage just streaming stuff. Um, my current 65 viewers is probably not going to be enough the, for me to, to drop a, <laughs> to drop my day job of streaming to much more than that normally, but we're still having fun here, which is the important bit. Um, Monty says fantasy, Final Fantasy, yeah, we, we're going to talk about Final Fantasy. That might even be the next slide, by the way. <laughs> Um, I, if I'm going to talk about Final Fantasy, I'm going to talk about Final Fantasy VII, just because of its cultural significance. And one could consider that one to be a, um, uh, a, what's I call it, a, a, um, a steampunk game, actually. Could it have been the first steampunk game? I don't know. It would be lovely to look and see whether, um, Final Fantasy VII is considered the spawning of the uh, steampunk genre. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> I love how I said this was going to be like a one hour talk and we're still in the 90s. Um, it's different because the last time I gave this talk it was to a live audience so I don't actually stop and talk about it in the way in, in meantime as we go but I think it's really fun to do this little live stream and talk to people as we're going. <laughs> Dean. <laughs> the, the number of jokes I get in my, in my actual academic lectures about like, follow and subscribe it's pretty funny. Okay. So, at this point, the PC is a big deal. Also, companies are appearing who will become the juggernauts of the future because of what they invent or what they perfect. So, one could say id Software invented the first-person shooter, and also one could say they perfect it a few years later when they make Quake 3 Arena, and they're just... I just, I love... I, you know what I love about this talk is how many fights I'm starting just for, for the fun of it. So I'm just going to throw down and say that the, um, the, the, what's going to call it, the, uh, the cinematic f f single player first person shooter was, was done at Halo Reach and you just don't need to continue that genre. And I'm going to say the competitive, the, the hardcore competitive shooter was done at Quake 3 and anything beyond that is unnecessary. <laughs> So I'm just basically putting myself up against everyone who loves uh, any kind of battle royale. Because <laughs> I'm like, nah, deathmatch or nothing. Um, yeah, but I think that's fun. I, I'm just starting fights for fun because I actually don't really participate in any fights over, over things. Because I think things are better for um, different generations, right? So if we released Quake 3 Arena now, like they released Quake Live um, a few years back, it doesn't resonate the same way because it's got a weird steep learning curve um and then once people are good at it they can really really make it boring for everyone else to play which is what i think makes fortnite more interesting it's much more accessible um you can tell it's accessible because if something's accessible we always look at it and go oh that one's for noobs <laughs> it's just like we're all noobs <laughs> anytime a new genre comes out we're all noobs at it right so it's like it's just how it works okay okay so Someone said Final Fantasy. There was a whole discussion in chat on Final Fantasy. So we must, we must hit this next slide. And this next slide is the console wars of the 1990s, right? Um, and Ian saying Unreal Tournament was aesthetically richer. So Unreal Tournament was, was, was great, okay? Unreal Tournament was a classic. But Unreal Tournament had to go up against Quake. And that's why um, I'm surprised that Unreal made it to today but i think they made it today because their engine was so good that everyone wanted to make games in their engine even if unreal tournament was a was like a, a competitor it was like the pepsi to quakes coke it's like yes it exists we all know it's there but no one really cares about it you know who drinks pepsi Ugh. all right i'm gonna start fights about drinks as well now right okay so the console wars escalate the console wars escalate because somebody decides to drop into this market, one of the biggest companies in the world at this point, because they created this little thing called a Walkman, which is the Game Boy for music. <laughs> I, love, I love talking about it in those terms. So the, the Walkman is portable music, right? And people absolutely love it. Sony makes a bajillion dollars. That's a real number. A bajillion dollars on it and says, hey, why don't we just... Oh, it, a word that they wouldn't have used at the time, but why don't we disrupt the computer games market? Um, and so they released the PlayStation, um, and I don't know how many people are like deep in the Star Wars references, but, uh, 
Only two there are, a master and apprentice. So, when there are only space for two, someone must die. And that is Sega. Sega doesn't die entirely, but they released their last console, the Dreamcast. And I put this photo in here, even though really this thing just never really happened. But I put it in here because it's the greatest console that no one ever bought. Like, <laughs> the games were good. The technical capability of the console was good. The way it rendered was good. It was reliable. It, it had everything going for it, except this thing just turned up with better marketing and just smashed the crap out of it. Right? It just, it just happened, and that's it. So that was the end for Sega, but good old Nintendo is still just, is still hanging on just fine here. So I said that I wasn't gonna, I, I, I realised in hindsight that I didn't have any photos of Mario, but I've mentioned Mario every time I've mentioned Nintendo, so they're still there. And people were talking about Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy VII. Let's pause for a moment and think about Final Fantasy VII. Um, I put Gran Turismo in here as well, because this is like a time where we've got like, nearly genuinely realistic driving. Um, so, someone who knows how to drive a race car might, I don't know, I don't really know how to drive a race car either, but they could do something like Gran Turismo and go, huh, you're getting pretty close to how this thing handles. Um, so that was important. Um, but driving games are like, you know how like, there's funny things like sport games are off on the side, and everyone goes, yes, yeah, sport games exist, but, you know, sometimes we care about them, sometimes we don't. The FIFA series is one of the few sports games that's managed to grab onto the mainstream gaming market and actually have some impact. But many of the sports games are like, no, no, you're off to the side. We don't care about you. EA has a separate division for sports because they know that it's a different, a different audience. But let me go, let me, let me just, let us pray at the altar of Final Fantasy VII for a moment. All of the best stories that you see in games nowadays all of the best narrative the games that genuinely make you cry the games that like transport you into another world and make you really believe it we have final fantasy 7 to thank for all of those i'm not saying that every single person who wrote a story in games was affected by final fantasy 7 but i'm saying that a vast majority of them played that game before making their games, you know? Uh, I just want to talk about spoilers, but I can't, right? So, there's a moment in Final Fantasy VII which really just kind of, it, it shook me to the core. And you know what that moment is if you've played it. If you haven't played it, don't talk about it. Go and play it, right? Um, there is a remake of it. I haven't played the remake yet. I don't know if I want to. When they remade Transformers, I was excited, and then I saw the movies, and now I don't like Michael Bay. Uh, but, like, I'm not sure if I want to play it, because this is a memory of a time of me as a teenager when I had the time to play those games and get really deep into it, and I loved it. And <clears throat> for me, it was a point where I said, ooh, this whole genre, this Japanese RPG genre, that's a thing. It's a real thing, and it's amazing. You know, even though I had played Zelda before, I didn't realize that Zelda is kind of like the epitome of the Japanese role-playing game, but it's slightly different to um, to Final Fantasy. So I think Final Fantasy is super important in this era. This is when it comes to it comes to the U.S. I think Japan had it before we did, or maybe maybe um, it just came out on the PlayStation both in Japan and the U.S. at the same time. I say Japan and U.S. because it's like the U.S. market's big, and we're just a subsidiary of the U.S. market basically. But yeah, okay, so I just wanted to stop and talk about Final Fantasy VII. Super, super important. Um, but the Nintendo 64 is the competitor against the PlayStation, so that's where the console wars happen in this generation. Um, Super Mario 64 is like one of the most famous games ever made. Um, it's one of the games that gets universally 100% reviews in everything. Um, uh, what are we talking about? God of War 2018? And the IGN review, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not, I haven't seen the IGN review, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> Deadly Fugu. Yes, I did not talk about Dragon Quest or Chrono Trigger or any of those things. Yes. Okay, so if you want to, if you want to, we can... 
<laughs> we can have like a, an entire two hour talk just on Japanese RPGs, but I can't I can't do that here. I just have to mention them. And I mentioned Final Fantasy VII because I think it had the most impact on the gaming world in general. So it's where Final Fantasy hit a certain stride in their in their storytelling. And I would yes, I would allow definitely allow people to argue that there was better story even in some of the other Final Fantasies, but this is the one that hit the mark. So it hit the market, it hit the market at exactly the right time so that a lot of people played it. So the story is something that we all share. Um, so that's why I think, like, when I'm talking about the games that, that rock the world and make history, it's not talking about their objective quality. Because then, in that case, the Sega Dreamcast is better than both of these consoles. But it's about do they hit the right place and time, and do they capture um, a movement, in a sense. So this is, could be a market movement, but it can also be... Um, are a lot of people playing it and talking about it with each other you know like that's the kind of thing that that makes a game stick and and i gotta i gotta come down here to this last point and people were watching when i was getting down here um so super mario yeah i was saying just top notch not just critics players everyone loves this game like it's just it's un unstoppable in 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 how solid the design was and also when you think about this it was a big risk to take Mario from going side to side to going forwards in a 3D world. That was a massive risk. I could see an argument in, in Nintendo for people saying, let us, let us never change this. Let us always go left to right with Mario. Mario will be permanently in a 2D world. And Mario returns to that world as well, right? But to go out on a limb and do this and then to just be so good at it without any experience. This is like the first iteration being the best. And it's like, ha, I don't get it. And this is again, again, why I keep going back to Nintendo and saying, if there's only one company making games, it's Nintendo. Um, and we have to acknowledge these, the, the, the giants of the game industry. So many of them have come from Japan. Um, so we have, to, we have to acknowledge that Japan's ability to craft an experience in a computer game the the masters have, have nearly always been Japanese I think we've got a lot more diversity now but back then very much so and this one this one here golden eye 1970s uh, 1970s 1997 sit on the couch three friends and yourself all plugged into the same console split-screen deathmatch first-person shooter this was the first time that people looked at a console and said you can do shooters on console. There were a lot of us at this point in time that first saw Goldeneye and went, shooter on a console, why bother? Then we played it for like five minutes, went, oh my god, this is the best, right? Goldeneye sits in a very, very particular point in history because it's very, very important in how it actually... Um, said that consoles can do shooters and people have already mentioned Halo multiple times in chat um, so this is um, Halo wouldn't have been able to exist if Goldeneye didn't I think um, the, the, the trust that a first person shooter could happen on console was established here by Goldeneye being so so good um what were we talking about? People talking about Mario Odyssey, pretty good. <laughs> Dean says Odd Job is cheating. Odd Job in um, GoldenEye was shorter than everyone else, I think, so he had a smaller hitbox. <laughs> yeah. A local restaurant called Four Pines lets us play GoldenEye on their console, so there's a, a bunch of stuff there, which is really cool. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to keep going. So... That's not it for the 90s, but that's as much as I can kind of squeeze in for the 90s. A lot of stuff happened. So the 90s we could consider an age of expansion of computer games, but then we hit the new millennium. Um, so this is from the 2000s onwards, and we could consider the 90s to be this kind of... I don't know what you'd call it, like maybe this kind of golden age of this expansion of computer games, and then we hit this certain point where we... By the end of the 90s, we think we've done everything. So I say that we've got 
console first person shooters we've perfected 3d platforming we have the pinnacle of storytelling we have the best first person shooter we have real time strategy and like I, I don't think real time strategy is perfected here I think real time strategy is perfected in Warcraft 3 um, and then everything after that is just unnecessary <laughs> I, just, I just like just dropping shit everywhere <laughs> There is so much opinion in this talk that is not necessarily correct, by the way. I'm just saying stuff for fun. Um, but I'm now starting to enjoy it now, because every time I, um, I say stuff, I get positive reinforcement in chat, so I'm just going to keep doing it. Okay, so, so it's nearly like at the end of the millennium, we think, oh, we've done everything. We've done everything amazingly. Um, so what could we possibly do next? Someone decides in the next decade to release these things and oh my god what happens next right so let's talk about mobile gaming and let's not just talk about mobile gaming on our phones but let's talk about mobile gaming in general um so this important point the nintendo ds which is not the game boy but it is now a ds double screen i think that's why it's called that um system where one of them is a touch screen so you have everything that you could do with point and click on a computer only it's tiny and it's in the palm of your hand um and it has a whole lot of the capabilities of the other nintendo consoles and because it's so portable and easy to use it outsold nearly every other console in the history of all consoles which is important because at the time it was competing against um the the regular consoles i mean i guess the game boy was also competing against the regular consoles um but the i think the sheer accessibility and just convenience of the nintendo ds made it the the most popular thing that existed also it was cheaper than a regular console so there's something to be said for that as well um <laughs> Did someone just say Raid Shadow Legends? Um, Sinio has a really good question there. Is the Switch considered mobile? And I think that's really, like, it just depends on how you use it. And I think Nintendo hit it out of the park with the Switch because what they said was, yeah, this is our mobile um, console and our home console, and it's in one thing. So both demographics that would buy this are buying it. Which is why the Switch is, like, outselling... Well, I think it's outselling the Xbox One by heaps, but it's not outselling the PS4. The PS4 is still king right now. But, you know, that's just right now. Who knows? Um, Leon said, I'm pretty sure some survey said 50% of Australians play mobile games because of COVID. So, yeah, there's a lot of that stuff going on. But let us... Let us go back to... Um, go back to this era... The Apple iPhone comes out in 2007. The Apple iPhone, even the first iteration of the iPhone, is a revolution. Um, it changes communication forever, but it also changes gaming forever. So there's this idea now that some games are designed specifically for touchscreen interfaces. So I brought this one in here. Um, what's the name of the company now? I can't remember the current name of the company, but it used to be called Firemint. Um, they got bought by EA, and so I don't know if they even exist anymore. That's just... Again, again, <laughs> talking about failures. EA is involved somewhere. Oh, no, I think they are still, still around. But anyway, this was a game that was made explicitly for the touch screen. So what you had these little planes that would come in off the side of the screen, and then you would drag from the plane to the runway, and the plane would follow the path that your finger had been on and go to the runway. So this is a game that's nearly impossible, before um, the touchscreen, but so, so nice for the touchscreen. So this is just an example. I picked this one out. I didn't even name it because it's not super significant, but I picked it out because it was made in Australia as well. So I just wanted to like, give a nod to, to some of our local devs. But yeah, so iPhone becomes super important and it opens up a whole new market. So imagine you want to sell games to the world and you realize that the games are gonna run on certain hardware and you have to somehow convince people to buy that hardware. And that's what Nintendo, Sony, and other companies have to do. Now, you have the marketing juggernaut that is Apple America 
deciding whether people should buy stuff or not, so you don't have to. So immediately, you have this gigantic market where the consoles are already there, and all you need to do is just make the games. So it opens up a whole new world for this. Um, and there's a reason why mobile gaming is, um, based on revenue, the biggest form of, of, of video gaming that exists. No console gets anywhere near it. Um, you add up all the consoles and PC together, and they're still less than the mobile market. Uh, we're gonna talk about that later. Oh, Sid says Fire Monkeys, that's it. Um, it was Fire Mint, I think, when they, when they created this. The other thing that happens, and I love this, I love this part of it, because I think this was a really, really fun time um, to be around. It wasn't a fun time to be a plasma TV with the number of these that just went straight through the front of it, because people don't always put this strap around the wrist. But we want to go back actually to even before the 2000s and look at this thing here, Dance Dance Revolution. So it started in arcades, um, and again, we can thank Japan for a lot of the work that was done here, is people went, okay, so you got your arcade stick and your buttons, and we make lots and lots of different software for the arcade stick and the buttons. And in Japan, they were just like, well, why do we have that? There's a game that I love, and I've never got to play it because I just haven't been to Japan that much. I visited the country twice, but I haven't really, like, hunted through the arcades looking for this particular game. But there's a game where the entire controller is this flat board in front of you with a hinge uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the machine itself. And on the screen, you have, like, a dinner table, and you're, like, a, a Sorari man at a dinner table, and the Sorari man's got, got his family and stuff around him. And then you've got to wait until a certain point where you're sufficiently angry at your family. It's a little bit like domestic violence here. So, but, like, but I still think it's hilarious because it's not real. Right? It's not real. But you can hit the table. And when you hit the table, your family gets concerned. And then if you reach the certain point of proper peak anger, you grab the table and you flip it. And that's it. That's the game. So the entire control of the game is a table. And, and you just flip the table when you think you're at your most angry. So, it's, like, I, d I don't want to chuckle about domestic, can, I, can we just stop for a moment? And domestic violence is a very, very serious thing. And, and yes, I'm talking about all this funny stuff that happens, but, but I really don't want to make light of things like that. So, sometimes when I laugh at things, I laugh at the incredulity of, of making a game where you would actually partially promote very, very bad behavior. Looking at you, Call of Duty, anyway. Uh, but, but yeah, so we want to be, um, we still want to be cognizant that, like, if we are the people making these things, then we do need to think about that kind of thing. Anyway, back to these controllers and things like that. Um, the idea that not everything had to have the same controls kind of appeared at this point. And um, one of the funny ones was Guitar Hero. So convincing people to buy a separate controller, this little plastic guitar. I've still got some in my garage downstairs. I've still got a couple of these that I never use. Um, and the fact that, that we could convince people to buy these things was hilarious. And this was such a massive thing at the time. Like Guitar Hero and Rock Band became just stupendous kind of movements on their own. And the companies who were making these things were just these massive companies that were like making billions of dollars and drowning in copyright issues where they had to pay all these royalties for the music they were using. Because if you didn't have music that people liked, there was no point doing it. Um, yet, if you were going to use that music, you had to pay for it. And the number of songs they had to pay for, there's a reason why these things don't exist anymore. There's a reason why these things fell apart. Um, because they just couldn't keep up with the the amount of money they had to pay for licensing and continuing making these things having said that the effect was still there the effect was this idea that your controller doesn't have to be the same shape as it's always been and we get the hilarious thing of motion controls in games and let us thank motion controls because if not for the research done on the wii which all it had was a simple accelerometer chip in it um if not for that, we wouldn't have the VR controllers that we have now. We wouldn't have had the research going into like, how do we get this really exact and perfect? Um, so 
the Wii really revolutionised what you could do in your home. And then we get Wii Sports, 2006. Um, it's launched with the console. And there's a weird, a really, really weird statistic somewhere that Wii Sports has outsold the console. Wii Sports comes with the console, but somewhere along the line, more copies of Wii Sports have been sold than the, the Wii. I don't quite get what's going on there, but maybe some people broke the discs and they loved it so much they re-bought it. But, but it's actually like, yeah, and 80 million copies. So we're looking at like the number of households in the world that have that have Wii Sports in it, um, and so we get this idea now that like we're starting to experiment, we're starting to branch out into other things, and it's not the only thing. So PlayStation and Xbox get involved. Ooh, Xbox, what's that? We haven't spoken about that yet. That's probably on my next slide. <laughs> um, they get involved as well. Xbox goes for a camera. Um, PlayStation tries to combine the camera and the Wii thing to a certain amount of success, but that console generation kind of gives way before it can explore these things fully. Um, oh, Clarissa, Clarissa is asking, are we going to talk about Skylanders? I'm not actually talking about Skylanders um, and the Amiibo and all this other stuff where toys are connected to your console, and I feel like maybe I should have at least said something here about that um because that attachment is really cool the only thing is the toy to console combo thing has never has never made enough of an impact to be necessarily historically significant at this point but it's something cool and I actually may add it to this slide as an extra point um <laughs> michael's asking if we're going to talk about pokemon um, we, we will potentially be talking about Pokemon. Another really, really important thing happens here. And I think this comes along with, and again, you know how I was going to talk about, I'm only talking about games, I'm not talking about technology. I've just sort of glossed over the fact that something happens in the 2000s, which changes the entire course of humanity, which is Facebook. I'm just going to like say it's just Facebook, because at that point, social media is nearly just Facebook. Right, and so we get games that can be played on Facebook, and the same kind of games start appearing on mobile as well. Now, 2010, one year after it's created, Farmville reaches over 80 million active users. 80 million active users for a game. So we think of the, the biggest, the biggest games. Uh, World of Warcraft has maxed out at 14 million active users um fortnite fortnite's big i can't remember how many active users at a time fortnite has had but it's more than world of warcraft it could be around this number but i think that the most important thing about farmville is it opens up a new genre and what it does is, is it says to players, you don't need the history. So this is the point where computer games have a history. So first person shooters, there are some of us who have been playing first person shooters since the mid nineties. And so at this point in 2010, if we're playing a first person shooter, we've been playing it from the mid nineties, we have like 20 or so years of experience. Um, which means we expect to use that experience in our games. We expect to beat other people because we're better at these games. Uh, I was definitely like that when I was when I had when I had my skills up when I was still fast. You'll get this as you get older. You'll slow down and then you get really really annoyed at first person shooters. <laughs> but anyway, the beauty of Farmville. I mean, not just on its own. It's it's got to be honest about Farmville. Farmville is slightly parasitic. It, it does give you a game that you can play, but it also gives you a game that keeps asking you to do things. So there's a, there's a, there's up and downs of it. But I think what's important is this idea of casual gaming is games that do not require skill in other computer games to be able to play. And that's very, very hard to design for. I mean, it's easy to design for if you just copy the same stuff that's been happening. Um, but if you can make a game that doesn't require prior experience in video games or computer games, um, 
it's roughly the same term, video games, computer games, it's really the same thing. Video games, I think, is just an older term. So you'll find me saying video games in the earlier part of the talk, and I switch over to saying computer games as we get into the later part of the talk. Um, if you don't need prior experience, then you have a much larger market that you can sell to. And I've got names of two companies here who have done some very horrible things. <laughs> Uh, Zynga and King make billions and billions of dollars on this. Uh, Angry Birds makes billions of dollars, enough to fund a blockbuster movie that really, really didn't need to exist, but it happened. Um, the The beauty of this, though, even amongst all of this kind of um, parasitic marketing and um, uh, forced addiction and things like that. And this is not the only place that, um, that human psychology has been used to tap into ways to keep people in games. I'm looking at you, Diablo 2. Um, there was a significant amount of work done in, uh, in, in Blizzard thinking about the idea of randomly generating things at a close enough time interval so that people could think that all they need to do is spend five minutes more in game and they may get another award. They may get something that will, will, will give them an improvement to their character. And even if they don't even notice the difference in gameplay, they'll still go for it and still go try to find it. And these games can do that as well. As a genre, the idea of making games more accessible to people who've never played games before is like an amazing and beautiful thing to do. But the genre itself is often very, very toxic. Yeah. Michael said I forgot EA. <laughs> Should have been more more things about how microtransactions have destroyed many different games. Um, yeah, and Miguel saying Zynga had a data breach um, and a whole bunch of emails and passwords were leaked. And, like, we could... I, okay, I'm gonna, I've got a slide on microtransactions. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. But anyway, actually, I think it's the next slide because obviously the conversation was going to go there from from those games so let's have a look at buying stuff for real money i, I hope you appreciate the joke in the slides here games are free this presentation can be oh wait i don't want to cover that up let that go on fade away this presentation can be fully unlocked for 49.99 usd buy now for a special bonus prize not available to standard level viewers I just had to put that in there because it was just like, this is what is happening nowadays. And I blame you. I blame you, TF2. TF2 is not, not the worst, but it brought an idea across that wasn't necessarily deep in the kind of what we call core gaming. Like these stalwarts, the first person shooters, the RTS. At this point, we've got these action adventure games. These AAA games had never done anything like this before. They were like, you give us money up front, we give you experience. We give you this beautiful experience. Um, but at this point, TF2 crossed the line. So let's talk about this, right? We're talking about buying in-game stuff for real money. And, and this predates this um, by a fair way. So let's, let's look back into the history of this. Second Life is like one of the games that we could think as as, as being a game that really made this big because it was, it was very early. So we're talking about before the rise of these casual games and phone games we're talking about that we see this in a lot. Um, uh, Second Life had um, money transactions for in-game currency, but also had a thriving market for people selling things to other people. Uh, and Second Life was reasonably big around then. Um, so in 2005, three and a half million US dollars moved around in Second Life. So those are all the transactions people were doing, either buying stuff with microtransactions or buying stuff from other, um, from other users in the game that people have created. So using that money that they, they'd bought. So the fact that it had an economy of three and a half million US dollars put it ahead of some countries in the world. It actually had a registered, well, like a, a, a measured gross domestic product. Like, there was enough income being made by the people living in Second Life that it was considered that it was generating money in the same way that a country does. Um, so, that's a little freaky kind of thing. Um, but where it really came into... Um, 
into the games we um we see as being the kind of the mainstream marketed game market is TF2. So <laughs> I'm jumping around here because I do want to talk about the significance of stuff like the orange box and valve and things like that. But that's actually in a later slide. Maybe I'll change the order of the slides later when I put that earlier. But anyway, Team Fortress 2 is a game that um, it's it's a team-based first-person shooter. So it's just a game about fighting groups of other people and stuff. But the joke, and it's really funny because the company themselves took on this joke, which they called TF2 a um, military-themed hat simulator because people were more interested in buying different hats in the game than they were in um, uh, in actually just playing the game. And people were making stuff for the, um, for the Steam Workshop at the time. And this is what became the Steam Workshop that went into other games like Counter-Strike and stuff like that. Um, and the interesting thing is they were making so much revenue from the sale of hats and, and things like that, that they went free in 2011. So they said, we can, we can actually give this game away for free because if we just get you to play this game, you're going to spend more money on other things. You're going to try to spend money on keys to unlock crates. And when you open the crate and don't get what you want, you might actually spend money on another crate. And that is slightly toxic behavior. That is the kind of thing that pokies use to try to keep you on the pokies and just keep trying to suck money out of you. And lawmakers at this point in time are trying to figure out entirely whether this is gambling or not. So they, they haven't entirely settled on this, um, but it's ongoing. And in the next few years, we could see this regulated in the same way as, as gambling is. Oh, you don't like microtransactions either. No? Everybody, someone's here to say hi. And she came in to tell everyone that microtransactions are bad. Are they ruining games, Chicken? Are they? She stopped me arguing because I'm carrying her now. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so, they become part of gaming. And they have now become part of gaming. And someone like Activision Blizzard, who has two of the games that are probably the most exploitative for continual updates, microtransactions and things, um, I'm looking at Overwatch and Call of Duty at the moment, made four billion US dollars in 2017 alone. That was years ago. That was three years ago. This has escalated since then. But in 2017, they made four billion dollars just from the microtransactions. We're not talking about the sale of games. We're not even talking about the massive cash cow of the constant subscription for World of Warcraft. This is just from loot boxes. And all of their games are games where you have to pay up front to play and then you get loot boxes. So this is, this is the thing that we'd have to argue against for these companies. If we ask these companies to stop doing loot boxes, they're going to say, well, we're, why would we stop earning this money? It's like, hey, person, can you please not earn $4 billion a year? It's like, oh, why would I do that? No, I'm going to keep doing that, you know? And so this is the problem we have at the moment. Is this something that is making the games worse? Is it making the games predatory to the psychology of, um, you know, random wins and, and, and the compulsion to throw more money like this... Uh, sunk cost fallacy to keep throwing money at things until you get that random draw that you want. Um, is that negative in the games? And if it is negative, then how do we argue against this thing that the company considers a huge positive for itself? It's like, what are we going to do about that, right? Super, super difficult. Um, so Clarissa is saying at least a lot of games are legally required to release the rates of their loot boxes. So they have to say, this is the percentage chance of this particular thing happening. Yeah, so hopefully that's good. But I don't think everywhere has um, legislated this. I think some of the big ones, like the UK and the US, are still deliberating over it. Okay. Back to good things that are happening. 
And it's really funny because I've already mentioned a lot of these things. In this era, after 2000, everything goes online. And I don't just mean that games are online. Like, we go to, like, 1996. Quake 1 had online play. But now everything is online. It's like this. This symbol here, which I'm sure everyone is very, very familiar with, is Steam. So Steam is the... Launched with the orange box in... Wait, I was going to say, when was it launched? Oh, 2003. It's in my slides. So launched in 2003, it provided a way of keeping track of the games you had. Um, and now we've hit a point where we've all got like hundreds of games in here we've never played. But that's a different story entirely. But what happens now is like we stop going into a shop and buying a disc. We're no longer buying a DVD of a game and then going and installing it. Now we're downloading games instead and all our games are just digitally owned. Um, so the beauty of that is that um, the Steam store can make a sale at any time of the day when you're sitting at home and you're bored and it's late at night and you just want to play a particular kind of game you can just pick it up on the steam store you don't have to wait for the next day and go into something like eb games or something like that and look for it you can just make impulse purchases anytime you want and it leads to the massive massive meteoric success of steam and they in the end provided a way for us to just organize our library of games i know people who have physical copies of games that buy it again on steam anyway and like and that happens not even let's not even go into like trying to replicate having the same games library in the epic game store and the steam store i'm not sure why the two of them exist but i'm quite happy at the moment that ea is sort of giving up on the fact that origin is not a standard marketplace marketplace that people use and have moved their library back onto Steam. So a lot of stuff goes online. So we're we're now in a world where stuff is is largely online and part of that world I'm just using the word world a lot because I want to talk about World of Warcraft. Now, World of Warcraft is not number one for MMOs. The the beginning of MMOs is Ultima Online and EverQuest. But what World of Warcraft does is it brings some of the genuinely best game designers of their era into the, the MMORPG industry. And World of Warcraft, once it enters that industry, it takes over and then nothing else will ever be the same again. This is what we used to call the Blizzard Effect. Um, the Blizzard Effect is now, I'm going to say, I'm calling it, is no longer in effect. But the Blizzard Effect used to be you have this thing, you have this genre, and you're like, that's cool. Uh, Blizzard comes along and does that genre and just does it better. Like, no matter what it was, it just comes in and does it better, and it, it takes over, and everyone wants to play the Blizzard game instead of your game. Um, that's why we don't really see Command & Conquer anymore, and we don't see uh, Westwood Studios, because <sighs> they got closed down by EA. <laughs> But anyway, it didn't matter because by the time we got to Warcraft 3, Blizzard had done real-time strategy to the point where it was it was beautiful at that point. And it's really funny because you look at that and and the the next generation of great real-time strategy games could only be released once Blizzard stepped out of the genre. Because Blizzard stepped out of the genre for like a decade, because they didn't really StarCraft 2 for a long time after that. And in that time, you get Company of Heroes and Dawn of War and some of this, and Homeworld. Actually, Homeworld may have been earlier than that. I can't remember exactly when Homeworld was. But you get those revolutions uh, in, in things, those, those little things afterwards, but those there's no room for those companies until Blizzard leaves. Uh, and so that's what Blizzard did with MMOs only that they still haven't left <laughs> so MMOs anyone else trying to make an MMO now might as well sort of not bother um, you kind of want to wait till Blizzard leaves and then you go for that innovation because in the meantime they have perfected their, their focus on what they're doing and World of Warcraft is probably just going to hold the same players for a very long time um, because 
we just don't we just don't really ever escape i played world of warcraft for like four years straight um so six hours a week worth of raiding committed for four years we were good too but anyway like <laughs> i i stopped doing that about three or four years ago so but it was it was it was a good time it was a fun time and world of warcraft is like one of those games that really really takes people in and was able to harness this online nature to put communities of people together also very good at putting communities of people against each other which is always more interesting if you have people to fight against sometimes <laughs> it makes you kind of like uh, more interested in continuing doing what you're doing um michael saying homeworld was like 1999 i like that typo homework was like 19 homework is so 1999 we're not doing it anymore <laughs> yeah um <laughs> sam's threatening to make an mmo Sinio was saying warcraft 3 reforged i still haven't got it because i just heard some really bad things about it and i just don't know i don't know whether i should or not it's again one of these things where warcraft 3 okay okay, okay. I, i'm gonna say this sorry okay. the story of arthas manethel in warcraft 3 is one of the greatest stories of a falling hero that has ever been told. It is significantly better than the Anakin Skywalker Darth Vader story. I'm spoiling all of this content right now, by the way, but I, I think that this content is at least a little bit universal. I apologize if it isn't. I've just spoiled two big things. But I think that the story of Arthur's Manifold just blows Star Wars out of the water. Um, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm going to move on. One can tell that I have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of love for, for the Warcraft series um, and the history of Blizzard games. I actually also love Diablo, but they don't really make it in here because Diablo is cool, but has never been super historically significant. Nowhere near what Warcraft is. Oh, and William's like Illidan also. I think the story of Illidan is cool, but it's the second one they did, and I think they, they just did Arthur's really well, so I don't need Illidan's story, because Arthur's story is just so good. Okay, okay, moving on. Another thing happens. A term appears in the late 1990s from a bunch of marketing people that want to make it sound like their games are better than other people's games. Um, this is a term called AAA. And AAA is something that we, we talk about nowadays all the time. I can talk about it as just a term we use. AAA just means big budget, big scope, and we expect a certain level of, what would you call it? Massive immersement or something, you know? We want to get really deep into these games. We want these games to give us something back. Uh, and so in the 2000s, there's a few series that are are really massive on this and they considered the the kind of the big triple a things and you know because they're still going now there's these massive unstoppable juggernauts uh grand theft auto from three onwards um because grand theft auto one and two are i want to say amazing indie games <laughs> they're amazing 2d top-down indie games but they're literally like three people in a garage again putting that together but then when they get to three and onwards rockstar studios starts acting like rock stars so they go big they release big and they i i want to say that they create this but i don't know if they created it but they definitely made the open world genre happen so grand theft Auto, we have a lot to thank uh gta for with those things um two things that were probably directly in competition with each other is the halo series and the call of duty series um call of duty has so many so many iterations right call of duty modern warfare and all these other things um like we just call it cod now and like just like oh, this whole family of games halo had less games but gonna say i played more halo than call of duty so i like it more <laughs> but again i just gonna say again because we talked about this before but halo reach halo reach go play halo reach if you, it's, halo reach is really cheap now because it's 
10 years old. Um, and it's been re-released on PC. It is... I just love it. Cinematic shooter. Vehicle bits. You know. Storyline. Triumph and tragedy. Ah. Oh. You can finish it in like 10 hours, so you can just be like, I'm only just, I'm just going to do this this weekend and I'm going to put it away afterwards. And it's really funny that like, I don't know if everyone else gets like this, but sometimes games are too long. And that's a reason why I will not replay Final Fantasy VII. So some games I just don't want to play for that long. Sometimes I want my story to be somewhere in the same order of magnitude as a movie. And so it's like I'm sitting down and watching a movie trilogy. I would play Halo Reach roughly the same amount of time. I'm just like, yeah, it's good. Had a middle, had a, had a beginning, middle, and end, a dramatic arc, and it finished, and it finished well. Beautiful. Dunk. You know? Anyway. <laughs> it's not the only thing that happened in AAA. Half-Life 2. The greatest and saddest thing in computer games is Half-Life. One of the greatest games ever. Um, oh, you know we were talking about Team Fortress 2 before? Team Fortress was based on Half-Life. Team Fortress 1 was a mod for Half-Life. There's a lot of the greatest games came out of mods of these things. <sighs> Half-Life 3. Let's just, let's take a moment of silence for Half-Life 3. So Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 are amazing. Oh, actually, this is pretty funny, putting F in, res F in chat for respects for Half-Life 3, when pressing F for respects is from Call of Duty. Wait, is it from Call of Duty? Or is it from one of the other military shooters that I never play because I don't like reality? Yeah, it is from Call of Duty, isn't it? So, um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, I kind of can't handle the real world aspect of Call of Duty. And it's weird because I can handle the real world aspect of GTA because GTA feels like a movie, not like the real world. Whereas Call of Duty is like literally a simulation of like real world combat. And I think about it, I was like, real people actually died in these situations and I just can't handle it. I can shoot aliens for hours, you know, but I, it's like the, the real people thing just kind of gets to me a little. But anyway, Half-Life, all right, Half-Life 1, Half-Life 2, brilliant. Half-Life 2 has these continuing episodes of, um, of where the story's going. The story hits a point where it's like, oh, this is, this is good. This is good. Looking forward to them wrapping this up. And then it just stops. Half-Life 3 is the greatest game that will never be made. Valve is in a position now where they're making lots of money, they're very famous, they take a cut of every other PC game that's ever made because it's all being sold on Steam. They have set up an impossible task, which is the possibility of them ever replicating the genius that they had in the early 2000s with Half-Life 2 and the other episodes, and somehow being able to finish this story now which 15 years later has so much hype and expectation attached to it that it will never, under any circumstances, ever possibly live up to the expectations that it had before. Which means, as a company, it is something that they cannot make. Because there is no way to do this and get a positive response now. Because the hype is too big. Well, it's not even hype. It's just sadness, <laughs> right? It's just not even, it's not even hype because everyone kind of knows that it's not going to happen, but it's sadness because you know it's not going to happen because there's no way they could make it as well. I mean, maybe even if they did make it as good as Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 is now 15 years old. So people are looking and go, that's a bit dated. You know? They're stuck. That's why I think, that's why I say F for respects for Half-Life 3, it's dead. It'll never be made, because there's no way they can do that in this kind of economic situation that they're in. They are too successful to take a risk, so they won't take that risk. That's my, that's my take on it. Gabe's not shifting on this. He's not going to go back in like that. Also, he's probably pretty old now. He's probably not even coding anymore. 
not even designing games anymore, right? It's, it's, it has to be someone else, which means they will take on someone new and the character that was in the game originally won't be there anymore. Anyway, that's going. <laughs> uh, Rory's asking if I ended up playing Half-Life Alex. I don't actually have a VR kit, which is a really dumb thing because I can afford one. I just don't have one. Um, I really should especially because I've been playing Star Wars Squadrons recently, and I think VR in flight sims is, is just such a good combo. But anyway. Um, Sid's asking if they're successful enough to take that risk. Um, I would say they are successful enough that they could weather that risk if it failed. But why would they? Because the risk is very, very great that this will not live, live up to expectation because it's impossible for it to live up to expectation. So even if the cost for them is low in doing this. Like, they will probably make most of their money back just because all of us are going to pre-order it, no matter what. Uh, it still doesn't matter. Because even, even if it's a low amount of risk, it's their reputation, right? If they do nothing, then their reputation sits as it is, and there's this mystery around the fact that it doesn't exist. Um, it can only go down if they release it. Unless they pull off some kind of Mario 64 situation. But I don't trust Valve to be, even be able to do that, right? Because they don't have what I would consider to be current, active game making chops. Like to be good at something, you've got to practice it, right? To be good at something, you've got to practice it often. You've got to be doing lots of iterations. Valve has just been sitting on their little pile of money for a long time. It's not a little pile of money. They've been sitting at the very top of a massive pile of money for a long time, and they haven't been making games, and other people have. Other people are hungrier for the success in the games. Um, Valve isn't, so I just don't think they will. But that's just my take on it. But I think you'll see that happen. I think you'll see the Half-Life 3 just never gets made. Or when it gets made, it'll be like Duke Nukem Forever. <laughs> well done, Gearbox Software. Way to buy random things and then not be able to revive them because you buy things that are just too stale by the time you buy them. Looking at you, aliens, colonial marines. <laughs> it's like random games out there. Like I just don't want to necessarily go like <laughs> too deep into like these really, really obscure games. But yeah, they bought Duke Nukem Forever and then tried to finish it, and it was just like, you should have not bought it. Just bought the license to it and started from scratch, because Gearbox has proven that they can make a good shooter like Borderlands, like good comic, uh, like comedy based shooter, which means if they just ditched everything that was in Duke Nukem Forever and started from scratch, then they probably could have done it. Honestly, I don't, I don't mind if Duke Nukem dies forever <laughs> because in, in that particular era, the war, because there's always a war. I don't, we can't, we can't just like have games that don't have war in them, but the war was between Quake and Duke Nukem at that point, and I was just like, thank you, goodbye, Duke Nukem. <laughs> okay, okay, so, AAA happens. AAA is, is huge. By definition, it's huge. And this is a very small set of what ends up being AAA. I mean, I just mentioned Borderlands, right? Borderlands is another massive AAA franchise. But on the other side another movement happens and this is a this is a beautiful beautiful thing so there's a bunch of small teams who <laughs> michael when's the q and a starting um i'm not i'm 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 kind of going to go over time i think i'm not even going to finish this talk in 2 hours my 1 hour talk in 2 hours um um ftl's made by a friend's mine's friend of mine's brother actually i haven't actually seen him in ages i should reach out and go hey dude i keep referencing you whenever i talk about ftl but um yeah so um ftl was made i think they did it in shanghai and um his brother came visit sydney for a while we hung out because we were all, we were both in that little kind of very very small sydney indie game scene at the time but anyway Small games made by small teams, and some really, really cool ones of the very, very beginning of these. Uh, so around 2008, I didn't put Super Meat Boy in here. Super Meat Boy is a pretty famous example of these as well. But Braid, I think, was the game that cracked open indies 
at this point. So a lot of these were from Steam because Steam allowed people to publish without a big publisher. So you didn't need your big marketing division and your connection to retail chains and stuff like that to be able to do things. Um, and Xbox Live was something that really, really launched this. So Xbox said, we're going to open this up to indie developers. Um, Kickstarter appeared around the same time. FTL is significant for being the first major Kickstarter. So it's like, seriously, two people and a composer. And they earned up $2 million. And they were just like, oh, I'm just going to put that in the bank because we don't need that much money to make this. So put that in the bank, ship copies of the game, and then see what we're going to do about it. They paid the composer and then just put the rest in the bank. Because like, what are we going to do with all this money? Right? So um, the good thing is, um, they did then get to use that money to make Into the Breach afterwards, which is another game that they followed on. But anyway, a lot about that. There's also this one here. <laughs> Gee, what game is that one? Minecraft becomes... I don't want to say the biggest game in history, but if you're going to argue about which games are the biggest game in history, this one gets into the argument. For sure. Minecraft gets into that argument. So many people play Minecraft. So, it... It has this... This beauty inherent in it for allowing openness and creativity. You know, you can do anything you want with your Minecraft world. You can build nearly anything. We've seen them. We've seen working CPUs in Minecraft that are like you know, in the game scale, kilometers long, because that's how big a CPU would be if every, <laughs> if, if, if every every working component of the CPU is like about a foot, one foot cube, right? Minecraft creates this kind of massive movement, has this massive momentum because you can be like, I don't know, I'm going to say five years old and, and have a successful game of Minecraft. You can't just hop into FTL when you're five years old and expect to survive. You can't hop into Grand Theft Auto. You shouldn't hop into Grand Theft Auto if you're five years old. But these other games, they don't have that accessibility. This has that accessibility, but it also has this depth of saying that you can play this game for 20 years and you won't see everything that you could have done in this game. You can build the Taj Mahal, every single mosaic piece in that historic building you can make a single block of that and you can replicate the whole thing if you really want to you know so i think there's some beauty in that what i love about this era of indies is they're not trapped these people are trapped and it's funny but it's like what i was saying about half-life they're trapped they can't experiment they can't bring something new because they are in a formula that they have which is this big juggernaut of money making formula and they're nearly trapped by their own money in that these people are not trapped because they're in the garage again they have nothing going for them um and at the point where they make these games there's just as much a chance for these people to just walk out of their garage and put a suit on and give up you know and that happens to a lot of people so only some of these things got big, but some of these things, um, there's a lot of games in that era that just didn't make it. And those people put suits back on and went back to work somewhere else in the tech industry. It's not like the tech industry isn't hungry for people who can work with computers anyway. Uh, um, but all of these people took risks. All these people took risks to do something different, which is why the indies created this world of um, making new stuff that, that people didn't expect before. Um, and so they brought in a whole bunch of creativity and that creativity has flowed back into, um, uh, back into the, the bigger games as well. I should probably also say that we are not going to go to till 4 PM as we planned. We're going beyond 4 PM. I haven't even finished the talk yet. So we're just going to keep going. <laughs> Hope you don't mind, Michael. <laughs> I think, I think Michael who signed me up for this talk already knew that um, he had signed up Mark G to talk again and like getting me to stop talking is not really something that happens in general. And Michael says it happened last time. I can't remember what talk I gave last time, but it was, it was the same kind of thing. Okay, Indies, 
beautiful, beautiful level of creativity. Very, very, very horrible level of um, psychological trauma <laughs> to the people who are making them. But, you know, it's cool. So 2010s. At this point, we have had a decade of what I would call innovation, but we're not done yet. We start seeing the idea that, and maybe even from what came out of the tech industry, that now we start changing the landscape of, um, of games. So the tech industry was really doing this in this era. Tech industry, like the word disrupt. <laughs> we're going to go into markets that currently exist and see if there's a better way to do things. And we're going to try to throw our tech in there and see if it sticks, you know. And so um, the 2010s is where a few things happen. And some of it is bold experimentation. Some of it is just like the development of things. Some of it is stuff that just randomly happened that took root and became amazing. So let's have a look at some of these things. One of the first things is that games were entirely in a virtual world. And there was like this disconnect between us being in that world or not, you know? So we were just on keyboard and mouse and stuff like that, but we weren't necessarily um, in the world itself. And so that's where we get VR. And <laughs> I love my little comment here, right? Um, we're not sure what it will do yet. We're still waiting for VR to, to really, really be something and I know, I know there's like people that just play Beat Saber for like 50 hours a week and, and good for you if, if you, if you enjoy Beat Saber that much, but Beat Saber is still a toy. Um, it's sort of interesting, but it hasn't got the whole world saying, I want, I want this to happen. It is not doing the Nintendo DS thing yet where everyone is saying, this is something that we all should own and we're all gonna we're all gonna play um so vr is sitting in a weird point at the moment where it's still in this chicken and egg phase so it's kind of like vr will be great if there are great games that use vr and convince us to buy headsets if there are enough headsets in the world someone will make a great game because they know that a lot of people have headsets and want great games because both of these conditions need the other one to exist we're just in this halfway point. And VR is not something that people can just take a punt on. So you're going to want... I'm just ballpark figures here. You're going to want to spend at least $1,000. I'm going to say more than that. I think for a good VR computer, you want to spend at least 1500 to maybe... Not quite $2,000. You'd get away with less. But, you know, 1500 bucks on that. And then you're going to fork out another, let's say, seven dollars $800 for the headset and the controllers and things and you're already at that point at that point you have let's just ignore the next generation that's coming but at that point you've got a ps4 and you've got about 30 games right and i'm just ballparking figures there so it's so much easier to just it's more than 30 games it's way more than 30, it's like 100 games right um and all the other like special controllers and stuff like that and anything you want um, whereas the VR thing at that point, you've just got the hardware and you know that there's not actually that much great software out there. So we're still, you know, it's still somewhere, but it's not anywhere yet. But I think it's something that's interesting as if someone was asking if I was going to talk about Pokemon, I don't necessarily talk about Pokemon in the, um, in their, their main line of games. Because I think it's deeply ironic that Pokemon is like super famous, right? And it's great. But in terms of Nintendo's lineup of games, it doesn't even get that close to the top. Because there's so many good just Mario and Zelda games. <laughs> even if we look at nothing else but Mario and Zelda and Pokemon, Pokemon always comes third in terms of game quality. Because the other two, I think, are very, very important to the company. And so they make sure that those are always the best games they can use. But, but Pokemon Go... It's only a little bit made by Nintendo. Um, actually made by ex-Google developers who are looking at um, interesting applications of the Google Maps uh, interface. Becomes one of the most successful mobile games of all time. And, and it's really funny because it just gets people to walk around the real world. Or hack the GPS coordinates of their phone. But mostly, it's just walk around the real world uh, looking for these things appearing in augmented reality. And I think that's a that's a really, really wonderful thing. 
Um, oh, and people talking about John Carmack. John Carmack, remember John Carmack from inventing uh, the, the 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 kind of graphics rendering that we still use uh, nowadays. I don't know if he actually invented it, <laughs> but I know he's the first person that that genuinely implemented it in a way that we're all going to use. Um, is actually working with Oculus Rift at the moment, so we'll see where it goes. But you know, I, I don't know. But Pokemon Go is super interesting because augmented reality is is something that we could definitely get something interesting going with, and. Uh, there was a little moment of Google Glass. There was a little moment of the Microsoft HoloLens. But wearing those big clunky things on your head is a bit weird still, and people haven't really gotten involved. But I heard that someone's trying to do it again. Was it Samsung or someone else? I can't remember. Samsung or Sony or one of them. So we'll see how we're going with that. Um... Oh, it's Apple. Yeah. Oh, so Monty was asking if I'm teaching Comp 3421 next year. Yes, I am. So uh, in terms of the polygon rendering and stuff like that, yeah, we're going to go through the history of that and learn how to build. Well, we'll see how we go, how to build a game engine. You know what I'm actually thinking of doing um, is uh, live streaming. So term two, I'm not teaching, um, but I've been given time to like prep 3421 in term two. So what I was thinking was actually live streaming my prep. For it, so I'm going to show you how Electro puts a course together, and it'll be really funny because you're just like, is he just looking that stuff up on Google and then writing it down in his slides? And it's like, yeah, well, that's a, why are we different from other people? <laughs> I mean, having said that, there's still like you know, there's 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 choice, but there's also going to be yeah, definitely going to be like times where I will just show a computer game and I'll say, all right, deconstruct this tell me what, which techniques they're using and are these techniques being successful? Or like, why is this game running fast and this game not? Is there something different going on? Anyway, let's not talk about that right now. We'll talk about them in the QAA afterwards. Okay, so VR and AR, super interesting, but we'll see where they go. I think they're really cool because I think this connection to the physicality of things gives us an, an extra level of emotion. So this gets us to the point where... Um, uh, when we're physically involved with our games, we believe it more. So we'll see where this goes, because I think it's a definitely a positive thing for games, but whether it can find a place in the market so that it really happens is another question that we haven't answered yet. Another movement, and this movement follows on from the indies, is games as art. And I actually say indie games pursuing deeper stories because this is really mostly the indies here. Got a lot of good examples here. I did put one in that's not indie um, because Kojima has been... Hideo Kojima, another another Japanese game maker, um, has been really pushing as far as he can for many years towards the idea of um, art house cinematic experience gaming. I joked about this with Metal Gear Solid, uh, I want to say 4? Metal Gear Solid 4? I can't remember which one it was. And I was like, I'm watching a movie where occasionally I have an interactive thing to do. But otherwise I'm watching a movie. And I joked about it at the time because I was like, I feel if I wanted to watch a movie, dude, I'll just watch a movie. Um, but now I'm starting to come around to, to why they're doing what they're doing. Anyway couple of these games super important because what we have now is the idea that some of the precedents that we set up in the 80s from games well, one of the precedents we set up in the 80s was like in the top corner of the game there was always your score tracker it was like how many points do we have and, th and that's what it is so it's entirely about scoring more points so you had a clear goal and then you just achieve that goal in which it, whatever way you can learn how to do in the game like shoot stuff or hit stuff you know and and that's cool that got us through a, a significant portion of the world of games um when we get to triple a sometimes it's not points sometimes it's progression in a narrative and then this idea of games as art takes us one step further or we can get into massive massive arguments about games as art because um one of the most famous uh, film critics in the world um, I think he's passed away. I think he's dead. Uh, Roger Ebert said 
years ago that um, it was a pretty dumb thing to say. He said, "Games are not and can never be art." And I was like, "If he if he if he left it at games are not art, we need to see where this goes." Um, I think that would have been interesting, but the fact that he said they could never be um, just showed a level of ignorance that a film critic shouldn't have, um, because all games are is a medium. Uh, a, a medium under which human expression can be made. So, of course, there are. Like, that is just the very definition of something that can that art can be made in. Like, it's something that human expression can be created. And so, there are a lot of some of the best games in the world that don't have these goals. So, instead of having goals, they are there to take players through a journey of experience and so by the end of the journey their life is a little bit different than what it was before they they've seen something new they have been witness to another human expressing the way they see the world right so um <laughs> Param Jane says games is art games as a service is what I want to pay for <laughs> Um, yeah, and that's the that's the downside is that a lot of our art um, in games is is very very commercial um, because just gonna go back to the slide again because of these. <laughs> but how is this any different from Hollywood? You know, if we consider all film to be art, which I would not consider all film to be art, I would consider some films to be art and some films to be like you get film for say advertising or something and you can get some really artistic ads but some ads are just there for a purpose you know they're just there to communicate um but you get your big blockbuster hollywood films and they've got artistic directors and stuff like that and so do these i don't think there's that much difference between a triple a game and a blockbuster hollywood action film um, they're set up the same way, they, they, they give you the same kind of experience, you feel the same kind of things out of it. What we get here is games where they're trying to look at things that are sort of fundamental to the human experience, in a sense. Going around shooting aliens is, shock and horror, not fundamental to the human experience. At least we hope not. 2020 is not over yet. The alien invasion still has time to start. Um, but these things take us through and they, they get us to question... Um, uh, question what we believe. They subvert our ideas and things like that. Or they subvert the specific genres that we're in. So they take an idea of something that we expect from games and they say, we're not going to give that to you. We're going to give you something different. Uh, Stanley Parable is a really funny one for that. Stanley Parable is like a first-person game where you walk around. I'm not going to say much about it because I don't want to give anything away, but it has a narrator. <laughs> And the narrator is telling you what you're doing as you're doing it. And it's just it's just really funny because the the narrator breaks the fourth wall in a way and starts to kind of pick at the tropes that you were expecting when you started playing a game. Um, I don't want to say more about it because I think the more I say about a game like Stanley Parable, the more I cheapen the experience. Like, so you really want to experience it, not, um, not necessarily um, have it explained to you. Have it explained to you, just... It doesn't have it doesn't have the same effect. Sinius uh, as the narrator is so annoying, but annoying in a beautiful way, right? Like annoying, but you love you you love hearing it. It's just so funny. Okay, I cannot I cannot go into the current era of computer gaming and not talk about esports and the rise of esports. And I think this is this is huge, right? And yes, yes, anyone from South Korea says, yeah, thank you for catching up. But for the rest of us, we're here now. Um, and, and Korea still, still totally dominates the esports circuit. So every now and then, it's, it's really funny um, that... Oh, Monty's asking where fighting game esports are at. I do mention fighting games later. Um, Street Fighter 2 is super, super important to me. I put it on the first slide in this. Um, but I only have a few examples here anyway in the slides. But I think this is... That's the Fortnite World Champs, that image, if I remember correctly. It's, it's either the Fortnite World Champs or that's Riot, but I can't remember. No, I'm looking at the logo and I can't quite, can't, can't quite see what it is. 
Anyway. Um, professional gamers are now like celebrities. They're now like uh, professional sports people were in a particular... In, in a previous era. Or maybe one could say professional sports people are still very rich people who are worshipped in the current era. But now we have esports people who are also very rich and worshipped in the current era. So we look at last year's uh, Fortnite World Cup. Prize pool of $30 million. Um, if I think about this, the prize pool for the Tour de France, the Tour de France is the biggest annual sporting event in terms of how many people watch it um it goes over an entire month of competition it has millions of dollars put into the teams and the technology to try to win this thing it has a smaller prize pool than the fortnite world cup did so massive tradition and hundred year history of sports and all this kind of stuff can't raise as much money as esports can and that's that's really saying something. So we're, we're, we're saying that if... And I don't ever really want to do this. But if we were going to measure the legitimacy of things by how much money goes through them, Fortnite is more legitimate than the Tour de France. And I would hate for that quote to get taken out of context because I absolutely love the Tour de France. Like, this, you know, I've got these little hobbies on the side. I'm not just uh, computing person but i used to like used to race bicycles for a little while and stuff like that and i abs- absolutely love the the drama and the tension and the tactics and stuff in bicycle racing um but i have to admit the, the truth is there the numbers are there uh fortnite makes a shitload of money <laughs> um it's it's in a weird place right now so um people were saying they're kind of sad that um uh in Australia, it's like League of Legends is really big here, and they're not going to go back to Rod Laver Arena for quite some time. So they did have some stuff, um, um, some big arena things like that, but I don't think... Uh, it's going to be a while before any of the big in-person events happen. Yeah. Um, someone was saying there, Monty is saying, wasn't Street Fighter Five meant to be in the Olympics or something? I think the Tokyo Olympics were considering... Um, esports as a possible event um, and it's funny because some people look at esports and they say well that can't can't possibly be an event and I'm just like how many other Olympic events are there that are not physical right so you consider the 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 physicality involved in um in certain sports is not really necessarily like people at the peak of their physical game. So something like curling in the Winter Olympics, where you you throw the the rock along the ice and you have to get it to stop at a certain point by judging it uh, and planning it and then scrubbing the ice a certain amount so that it stops in an exact position. That's a skill thing. It's not you don't have to be in your peak physical condition like a sprinter or something like that to compete in that. And it's seen as legitimate. Uh, Olympic sports, so I I see no reason why um, uh, esports can't be in something like the Olympics, especially because if you look, if you look at the skill on display in the world's top teams in esports, you cannot deny the amount of work and effort and training and inspiration and and passion they've put into getting that good at that thing. And then when you see people dominate other people, you look at that and you just go, yeah, that that person just straight out is so good at this that we just can't even, we can't even comprehend how they can be that good at that. It's like, how do they somehow know what the other person was planning to do before they're doing, because they're thinking that far ahead, you know? So I think there's, there's some beauty in that. Or the people who can like, I remember, oh, I can't remember their name. There's a professional StarCraft Two player who who made their name playing with Marines, like the the super super basic grunt unit, and they were so fast with their clicking and moving that as they approached combat, they would just move individual Marines. So there were only fifteen twenty Marines, and they would move individual Marines into a particular formation which was optimal against their their enemy, and they could do that in a couple of seconds. 
Like, it would take me, like, ten minutes to go, okay, this one goes here, this one goes here, this one goes here, and they were just doing it in the second they were doing it as they were on approach. Um, so that kind of, that kind of skill is such a beautiful thing to see. Um, I don't actually watch as much esports as I should, but I'm keen to kind of get into it more. Yeah. Oh, that's really funny. Shrey's got a good point there. <laughs> Honestly, uh, he's saying he doubts that something like League would ever go to the Olympics since there's actually so much less money there compared to running them on their own <laughs> with their own sponsors. That's really, really funny. Yeah. Um, Dean saying chess as an Olympic sport. I'm really surprised that chess has never been an Olympic sport. I think chess and Go could very much be that, but I think they also may have the same kind of thing as League, where they're like, no, we've got our own competitions, we don't need to be a part of this, you know? So maybe they're, they're, they're kind of protecting their own thing rather than joining up with the Olympics. The Olympics is not necessarily this pinnacle that everyone wants to be at, because if the Olympics is the pinnacle... Again, <laughs> Fortnite's making more money. <laughs> I don't know, Olympics is a huge thing for tourism and stuff like that, and promoting different countries in the world, bringing a lot of people together and stuff like that. So there's a lot of value in the Olympics, which is not monetary. I don't want to, I don't want to come off from this talk saying that I judge all the value of all games and competitions and stuff by how much money they make. Someone just said chess has been popular recently on Twitch, so I had to hit the next slide. Twitch appears in 2011. And this is a hilarious question because before 2011, you would be kind of be laughed at if you, if you, if you said something like this, like, why would you bother playing games if you could just watch someone else play the games? But we're literally doing it. We're, we're literally doing it and, um, and we love it. It's kind of fun. It's the same thing as the esports. Esports are all streamed on the same channels. Watching someone else display extreme mastery over a skill is a beautiful thing to see. I mean, that's why, like, you know, TikTok and Instagram, I, I follow someone on Instagram that just makes wood sculptures, and I just love watching the videos of them turning the wood on a lathe, it's like, and the thing spins, it spins that way, sorry, and then they, they, they carve it into shapes and stuff, it's like, oh, that's so cool, right? Watching someone else perform mastery is beautiful, and on the other hand, watching someone just get the experience of a game and some i think some of the best streamers are people who know how to to sort of wear their heart on their sleeve react to the game in a way that's going to um to, to make it really interesting to see how they react to those games and so they've got huge followings so we're looking at like the the biggest person on twitch i don't know if he's currently the biggest person on twitch but he was definitely used to be and probably will be um is a guy called Ninja. So even after getting, um, getting paid a boatload of money to go across to Microsoft Mixer, which is a really dumb idea. So Microsoft tried to compete against Twitch, um, failed, shut down Mixer. And so people like uh, Ninja and I can't remember, a couple of the other big streamers who got pulled over there are now going back to Twitch. Um, so even after that drop, uh, Ninja's back to 16 million followers and putting together estimates of his Twitch channel and his YouTube channel, uh, we're looking at, uh, including product endorsements and stuff like that, someone's making $18 million a year um, playing computer games and talking about computer games and just broadcasting. As you think about that, he's probably making more money than IGN. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. IGN's probably making a decent amount of money, but I don't know if the entire company of IGN is turning over $18 million. <laughs> so it's really, really interesting. And I feel like this is... Um, this is the anarchy of the internet. The hilarious anarchy of the internet where people can just do stuff, right? Individuals can do stuff and their following just grows. And then it turns into this kind of thing. And so I think that what we're going to see is like in the, in the future, we've got this idea that games are not just for you to play. Games are there for other people to play sometimes and for you to watch. Um, and there's some funny, funny things. I think like one of the funniest ones I was watching um, is stuff like Among Us. So that's like the hugest thing right now. But 
it's really fun to watch because when you're watching it, you can kind of see more than the players can see. And so you know what's going on. There's a story and there's some, some drama going on. So it's like super interesting. Um, wait, AOC's live streaming Among Us. That is so cool. I love it when politicians are like smart enough to actually get involved. You know, like, actually, like, it's the same thing as like us as lecturers. It's like, how do you connect to your students? Right? Oh, Carvan Chen saying, uh, it ruins friendships, and I think that's so funny. I've, I've seen people nearly break up their, um, uh, break up relationships over games of Mafia and things like that, because, like, you know, it's, it's based on these old games we used to play as, as groups when we could be physically near each other. Right. So, that is nearly all the history of gaming, <laughs> and we make it to 2020. So, 2020, and we were just talking about streaming among us. Gaming as society crumbles, so society as we know it is not quite the same as it was at the beginning of 2020. We had plans for what we were going to do in 2020, and I don't think a lot of those, um, a lot of those plans definitely came to fruition. A lot of us turned to games to fill the gaps in our lives. Let's have a look at some of those that, um, that, that, that happened in 2020. So we start to think of games maybe as an escape from the world or games as a way of connecting with people that it's very hard for us to connect with um, physically now. Like, I've got a bunch of friends who I was going to meet up at PA meet up with at PAX this year, and that just didn't happen. And I feel bad because I haven't really organised anything else for us to, like, to meet up or anything or, or do anything online. Um, so when we were all sort of driven indoors by the pandemic and the lockdowns that are happening like that, there was a massive buyout of gaming consoles. The Nintendo Switch actually had a black market for a while there. So um, it was selling for significantly higher than the retail price on eBay. And every time there was a delivery of Switches, they were being bought out by scalpers before any, any normal people could get them. Animal Crossing is a game that exploded in popularity in a massive way. And I think it's because of the pandemic. And I don't want to... I don't want to discount the quality of game that Animal Crossing is. I've played a lot of it, and I've noticed the kind of game design which is nearly the pinnacle of game design in Animal Crossing because it's the kind of game design that makes you think it's not there. Everyone thinks Animal Crossing is a simplistic game. It is not a simplistic game. It is one of the most complicated games ever made. Every tiny piece of that game is sculpted absolutely perfectly. Every single little sound that you hear in that game and you think, that's just a cute little sound in the background yet you can identify it exactly, you know what it is, you know what thing it means, like is there a star falling behind me, is there a cricket buried in the ground underneath me, all that kind of thing. When you get to know it, you know exactly how to use it. If you don't know it, you think it's this beautiful ambience, and so you, you, you just don't know the difference. It, it gets in under your skin. That, again, I'm going back to gushing over Nintendo. That is Nintendo's design principle, you know? That is them saying, everything in this game fits together. You will believe everything in this game. So we've gone through, they've probably gone through and remade this game three or four times, like from scratch in their development cycle before they released it. And they've come through and they've gone, let's get user experience designers, a whole bunch of them at the top of their game. Some of them are are purely audio designers for that kind of thing. Some of them are just working on how to do simplistic movement of characters. So the AI in um, in Animal Crossing for all the other villagers, I'm, I'm talking more about Animal Crossing than I was going to, but anyway, someone has done a lot of study on preschool age children and the way they act and they've put that AI into the villages. 
so that when the villagers run around, they do some incredibly cute things with the kind of timing and behavior patterns that little kids do, and we look after them on instinct because of the way they act. It's so amazing. Like, you just think, if I was going to make a game like Animal Crossing, I'd make the villagers just walk around on a random pattern. I was like, here's a random number generator. Walk around randomly. I don't care. But it's not random. It's so specific. Like, if you really, really analyze what they're doing there, they have gone to great lengths to hook into the human psychology there and say, this thing matches the kind of thing that you see in the world in a way that you're not expecting, but we'll put our hooks into you and you will love these villages. Someone will leave your island and you'll be like, no, no, they were my child, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, and, and it, it works. And what Animal Crossing did in 2020 is it gave us a world we would we could go to that wasn't trying to kill us. And I don't know if the devs of Animal Crossing really understand or acknowledge that they may have been a significant factor in reducing rate of suicide in a lockdown. Because lockdowns do have some some negative effects on people's psyches and animal crossing gave so many people a way out a way that they could escape from the world that was was so hostile um and give them a world where they were free to create and to take care of things um and to and to just kind of be in a world that was completely non-threatening i love that i'm saying that while there's sirens outside as well yeah so um yeah, so I think I think there's something really, really beautiful about Animal Crossing that it, it's nearly, and it's like, it's so funny. It's like it's like when you think about it, it's like it's a really simplistic game. It's not something that you um that you build up skill in or anything like that. Again, you know, I was talking about accessibility in games. Anyone can play this. It released at the perfect time for it to give the most to society, and I think there's nearly nothing more beautiful than that that Animal Crossing gave to society in a really weird way that they never would have been expecting. Most of the, mostly when they made it, they were like, let's just make people enjoy this. It's a cute, fun experience. They enjoy it, no pressure, you know? And then they'll, they'll like it. They'll buy the game and then they'll play the game. It's fine, you know? And then afterwards, it's like, oh, we gave them an out. We gave them an escape from their world that didn't put any pressure on them. And they didn't realize that how many people would need an escape that didn't put pressure on them at that time um, in history. Uh, so I think this is like Animal Crossing is going to be one of the things that historians will never talk about um, in terms of the pandemic. But those of us who are in games, especially those of us who played Animal Crossing during lockdown, um, are always going to remember it as being one of the most significant things that happened in lockdown. Um, among Us. So yeah, we talk about Among Us 2020, but Among Us is 2018 game. Um, Among Us is really interesting because what it does is it takes a genre, a well-trodden genre, and, and, and what it does is it takes it from the realm of in-person board games where this genre has been around for at least a decade, actually well over a decade. Mafia has been around for 30, 40 years, I think. Um, but brings it to a point where you can play it online. Um, the rules are really similar to, to other games, the idea of hidden roles and, and kicking people off the ship and stuff like that. But I think one thing that makes Among Us really great is it's one amongst other avenues that people have to connect with people that they can't necessarily connect with physically. So I've got a friend that lives in Canberra. We're not going to and from Canberra at the moment. Are we allowed to go to Canberra? I don't even... I actually think we are. Like, New South Wales and the ACT are both, like, kind of clean enough that the border lockdown isn't, isn't really happening at the moment. Um, but, yeah, we've been playing a little bit of Among Us with them and, and some other people. And then so it's, it's kind of cool. And it's really funny because it's not, um, it's not really groundbreaking. It's just taking a genre and converting it to another media. And you can tell it's not really groundbreaking because in 2018, no one cared. 
I think they were like, oh, we sold like, you know, a couple of thousand copies. And we were like, that's great. We're this little indie team. We sold a couple of thousand copies. That means like, you know, we can pay rent for the next month. Um, and then it got picked up by streamers in 2020. And then it hit a different world. And it hit a world where people couldn't just pick up a copy of like the resistance. So by the way, the resistance Avalon is, I like to say the resistance Avalon is where the genre peaked. So these games have been developed in, in board gaming for quite some time. And there, there are points at which, um, the resistance has just enough to make it really interesting, but it doesn't add anything more. So it's really interesting while still being very light. So I think it's a really interesting game. Um, but, um, but what was I going to say? Yeah, Among Us does a very similar thing and I think it's very interesting. So I think what we're getting out of Among Us because I just, my, my review of Among Us is I, I don't think it's like a super amazing game but I do think that everyone's playing Among Us because everyone's playing Among Us. And if everyone's playing Among Us and you want to play with your friends, you might as well play Among Us. There are much worse games to play. Um, but I, I wonder about playing it much slower than normal because a single game of Resistance takes like an hour, um, whereas Among Us is much quicker than that. If you had a really long time on the, um, on the vote timers and then you really, really get into conversations about what's going on i think it could get really interesting because then you can get that kind of like you know how good is everyone at lying i got really good at lying in these games i mean you can kind of tell someone who speaks for a living is probably going to do better at these games than other things especially because like you know my job is all about putting ideas into people's heads it's pretty good if you're an imposter <laughs> anyway anyway let's um <laughs> Rory need at least five friends which is unrealistic I think that CSC Sock is pretty regularly running um, among us things so you can always join in there and you can make new friends via university okay so I'm reaching the end of the talk now which is good because I'm only one and a half hours longer than I said the talk was going to go for so where are we in the present day arcades still sort of exist but they're not considered super important. So we still have time zones in Sydney, and that's cool. Competitive fighting games, I think, are the things that kept arcades open for a long time. So the competitive fighting genre is huge. Um, I say Street Fighter 2 to 5, as they are at the moment. Um, as I said before, Street Fighter is super important to me. So I think that... Um, uh, there's something there still happening. And stuff like Dance Dance Revolution still being played a bit. So the arcades can still be considered a place where people are interested in physically hanging out with their, their friends and physically playing some games. So you see some really, really old games that are still there. So Time Crisis, um, Dance Dance Revolution. Uh, what other stuff did I see at Time Zone recently? Um... And even those silly kind of like carnival games where you throw balls into hoops and stuff like that. So that kind of thing is still entertaining, um, but I wouldn't put that at the forefront of gaming. Even, even the competitive fighting games, they're just online now anyway. So Street Fighter 4, I think, was one of the first ones to go online and make that work. Um, that shattered my ego at that point in time because I don't know anyone who can beat me at Street Fighter all of my friends have not had the requisite training to beat me at Street Fighter, but apparently everyone online can. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> being, you know, like being a slightly bigger fish in a tiny pond and you think you're huge and then you just go swimming sharks and you just die. Yeah, so that's what happened to me when I played Street Fighter 4, Street Fighter 4 online. <laughs> oh, Monty's saying Street Fighter 3 was online, but it was like, um, I think not quite as big at that point, right? Um, oh, Michael's asking, wonder what the game design major for, what happened to the game design major for, for computer science? I think, um, an uh, old friend of mine, Malcolm, was running that, and he left CSC around 2012, 2013, or something. The game design course used to run. Anyway, 
Console Wars. Console Wars are still going. Nintendo is still just as consistent as they used to be. Always pumping out quality. Always dominating the handheld market now that the Switch is technically handheld, right? But Sony's the big fish. I think that in terms of monetary sales, and this is not the same as numbers because the Switch is cheaper than the PS4, um, but still, it's it's how much people are willing to, 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 to put into it. Um, Sony, I think, is nearly double what Nintendo is at the moment. And Monty says, just blame the netcode for fighting games. Yeah, obviously, I'm going to blame the netcode. But um, no, I, I know it. I know. And Monty, you seem to be someone who knows these fighting games, so I assume if I played you, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, PC, and this is interesting, because the PC versus console things, there were quite a few times in history where the PC was really, really losing against the consoles, but not anymore. Um, eSports is very, very PC-based. So, League of Legends, obviously, people were talking about that in chat and stuff like that. Um, a lot of the esports are based on PCs, and so that's kind of bringing PCs back as a as a really primary gaming platform, and your MMOs as well. So a lot of the games that people are committing, you know, the thousands of hours games or games where they measure gameplay time in days instead of hours. Like, I remember one of my characters in World of Warcraft having like 70, 80 days of played time. So I don't know how many hours that would be, but it's probably shouldn't count it right um so the pcs are still quite strong there but the interesting thing is like mobile is huge um mobile is deceptively huge so mobile is accounting for more than 50 percent of the total revenue of the gaming industry which means that as i think i said this before in the talk add up all the other money being made in games mobile games are making more money than that Thanks, Clash of Clans. <laughs> I didn't even mention Clash of Clans. I could have mentioned Clash of Clans in the um, in the microtransactions bit. Um, games where actually we did we did talk about microtransactions, but games where the price tag of a AAA game is less than the largest thing that you can buy as microtransactions in little games. Um, games that didn't cost that much to develop. That's where a lot of money can be made. Um, unfortunately, a significant number of those games are made specifically to make money and not to provide any kind of interesting experience, which is, you know, that's that parasitic kind of feeling. And you know when you're playing those games and you're like, if only I could continue this thing, but I can't get more timers on this thing to do the stuff I want to do. A lot of them to go in real time, those idle games. Um, without paying money and so that's where I think mobile gaming is making a lot of its money VR as I said before it's there but it's still waiting to waiting to know what it is maybe <laughs> Rory saying pay two ninety nine to remove ads by the way if any of you are going to make um, uh, make games at all never put in the thing where someone pays a static amount of money to remove ads that will always get you less money. Um, instead, do the thing where you will give them in-game currency if they watch another ad. <laughs> that will make you more money. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> stuff I used to teach when we teach people how to make computer games. <laughs> it's a little bit cynical. Okay, so that's where we sit now. So what is the future? So what are we doing in the 2020s and onwards? So this is all going to be kind of guesswork for where I think um, the old pillars of gaming, which ones are going to stand, which ones are going to crumble, and what things are going to happen. So arcades have shrunk. I don't see them ever having a resurgence. I think everything that can be done in arcades has been done in arcades. And there is nothing in arcades that is a higher quality than what we can have at home except for building physical apparatus to do things with. So I think they will lean into that, and that's all they're going to be. Um, PCs and consoles are giving space to mobile gaming. I say this down here in this other point. The Switch is the perfect example of this, and people were asking me about this. It's like, do you consider Switch to be mobile? Um, and the answer is yes, no. <laughs> right? It's both. 
the line's gonna blur. The line's gonna blur to the point where your primary gaming console won't require um, power, and it may not require an external screen. Um, whether or not the the big name Sony gets involved with this or not is another thing. They did have a handheld, the PS Vita, but it came and went. It went up against Nintendo and lost, and they just went, Ooh, maybe we should just keep doing the thing we win at rather than trying to do the thing that we lose at, right? So, um, and several people have tried to make gaming-specific phones. Have you noticed, uh... Who is it? Asus. Republic of Gamers? Is this either Asus or Acer? Uh, Acer Predator or Asus Republic of Gamers is releasing a gaming phone. I'm just like, is that an iPhone? It's just an Android phone. It's just an Android phone. And it's like, how is this going to have a better processor than a high-end Samsung Galaxy? I was like, I don't think it is. Maybe it's just going to have a big heatsink on the back. And like... LEDs around the outside and that like Asus Republic of Gamers design where everything looks like a sci-fi helmet with like red eye slits and stuff. I love joking about this. That is my computer right here. <laughs> it's a Republic of Gamers. But I think that what we're going to see is that I'm talking decades into the future. We're going to see the fact that portable computing will become the norm. Portable gaming will also become the norm. Um, we do like sitting down on the couch though. So I think the model of the Switch might be the future, but I, it, it's hard to say. Um, esports, spectator gaming, the cult of celebrity and streaming, that is definitely going to continue. Um, I think as big as that is now, as big as we think it is, it's not as big as it could be. Um, I think that the whole idea of like, you know this concept of Friday night football? where they, they play, I think this is in the US thing, they play NFL on a Friday night, but like Australia had the same thing with like rugby league and stuff like that. Look for a future. We don't know exactly when that's going to be, but look for a future for that to be replaced with esports. I think that it will take a certain shift in culture, which is based on the generations of humans. So if you look at my generation, people who are just kind of middle-aged, now so you you're gen x um and and possibly some gen y as well when we hit a certain age where actually we're not going to watch tv anyway it doesn't matter but we're going to stream we're going to be streaming things and the the primary form of kind of entertainment where sports used to exist will be esports instead and it'll be generations like mine who grew up with computer games that are going to be the ones that push that at the beginning and in generations like yours that l get to live in the new world where that happens because the generations before mine didn't grow up with computer games because they didn't exist yet so you'll get that point where it becomes the norm and when that becomes the norm then this becomes mainstream and it becomes mainstream entertainment so like you just random talk shows will talk about gaming esports um, stars will go on like you know, um, alongside movie stars and stuff on all those talk shows and things like that, they'll be at that level. Um, we'll see where that happens. I'm definitely thinking there's going to be more social media integration in games. I think they're going to... Games are going to try to connect you and connect your data up to other data as much as possible because the world, the greatest commodity in our world right now and going into the future is not money, but it's information. And it's information about us that can be used to generate money that's more valuable than the cash itself. So I think that we're going to see more and more that our games are going to have us log on with our online profiles for other things. And so our gamer tags and our gamer nicknames, like our Steam nicknames and stuff, are no longer going to be our Steam nicknames, but they're going to be like our Facebook IDs and stuff like that. Um, it, like I think that that's, that's something that's going to happen because the market kind of wants that from us <laughs> it wants to know everything we're doing so it's the kind of thing that we're kind of going to get pushed into whether we want it or not um <laughs> vr i keep talking about vr yeah we want we want something cool to happen with vr i don't know i don't think it's a fad i don't think it'll disappear i think it just needs the right set of conditions to become normal i see a future where there are no monitors but 
to be 100% honest, even though I see the future, um, uh, with no monitors, I don't know how to get there. So it's an awkward, it's an awkward, uh, kind of combo there. Um, so David there was saying before an update hiatus, an indie game that they used to follow would put out weekly Friday updates and you'd always watch it from 11 PM to AM the streams. See, that's cool. That's, that's what I think it's going to be. And then when TV stations realize that Twitch is bigger than them, you might actually see something interesting happen where TV shows go onto streaming. At the moment, they've gotten as far as um, like Netflix and other on-demand streaming services, but I'll be interested to see stuff like the news go on live stream. Um, actually, that's not even that's not even remotely like a a future thing. Um, you can watch the ABC live stream every day. Um, they all they had a live stream of um, pandemic information the world health Org organization is streaming every single day pandemic information and stuff like that um during the bushfires there were like continuous live streams and so we can we can see the tv channels realizing that tv is like a, a superseded medium i wouldn't call it a dead medium because it's still working we're still using it um and there's a lot of people who don't stream and haven't picked it up yet so we see that there's a crossover between the two at the moment um, but I think we're going to see that um, uh, streaming is the new form of mass media um, TV just hasn't realised it yet um, and what else? I don't know every decade seems to add something new um, the, like you know at the end of the 90s we thought we'd seen everything in games and suddenly all this new stuff appeared and then in 2010, it's like, oh, well, we've got, we've got all this innovation that's happened, so what happens next? And we're like, something else still happened. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next with games. Um, I think that a bunch of stuff is going to happen, but I also think a bunch of stuff that I definitely have not seen coming is going to happen as well. So Michael's saying, looking forward to the death of the keyboard. I have this whole thing I go, this rant they go on about keyboards, about you consider the, um, the amount of bandwidth of data that we consider um, a bare minimum to be able to use computers, the amount of bandwidth to use an internet connection. We're talking megabits there, right? There is no human physically capable of doing megabits worth of data transfer using a keyboard. Um, Whereas I'm currently streaming at about a megabit a second. Actually, no, I'm, I'm going at eight megabit a second upstream at the moment. Wait, megabit. I think I'm confusing bits with bytes at the moment because I'm going at 8,000 kilobits per second. Um, which is, oh, that is eight megabit. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm going upstream at one megabyte a second now that I think about it. So a human can generate that much bandwidth and send it out into the world, but you can't do it with a keyboard. If I was just not doing anything but just typing stuff in a keyboard, um, everything would be really, really slow. So the keyboard is such a relic um, from an era where the amount of information transfer we had was incredibly, incredibly low, yet we're still using it. We need to find something better. I don't know what it is. Um, and you can see how many different control devices have been created that are much more physical. Um, that are much more interesting to use, but we haven't come up with something that can replace it to the point where we could use it for everything. Um, yeah, and Dean's saying touchpad. So touchpad is a is a, is a great kind of um, change for computers, um, but it's not necessarily increasing our bandwidth. So who knows? Who knows? Okay. This is my final slide. This is where I leave it. This has been my talk on um, the, a brief history of computer games that turned into a very not brief history of computer games. So um, I think that's really funny because the last time I gave this talk, I squeezed it into one hour. So I obviously didn't go into detail on anything. Um, and this time it was like three hours. Um, so, Michael, Michael's saying three hours is very brief, changed my mind. Well, we're talking about 70 years 
of history in even if though it's only one particular topic it's still 70 years of history so i i think me getting this down to three hours was pretty good um so let's have q a carvin says 10 hours i could have gone for 10 hours um i would get a little bit tired of talking so any questions anyone has about uh, the gaming industry or the history of gaming or even um i think that maybe as students some of the questions you might want to ask is about working in the gaming industry or anything like that um i've got a lot of friends that work in the gaming industry i tried to get some of my friends from um the the triple a industry to come and talk um but then I got a list of conditions under which they're allowed to speak to media, and I realised that I'm technically media in this case if I was going to interview them. Uh, and then we just couldn't... We couldn't actually swing it. It was going to be like, here's my friend who works for Redacted and worked on Redacted, and we want to ask them about things, but some of your questions will be redacted so so there was a lot of like um yeah was a lot of, in the end i thought oh why don't i just answer the questions then i can be like really open about what's going on instead uh masony mark are you a star citizen backer of course i'm a star citizen backer aren't i a living breathing human being aren't all living breathing human beings star citizen backers <laughs> how much money has that game made without releasing it's like ten million dollars without releasing. <laughs> Rory asks, "Is getting a job in the Australian game game industry a realistic goal?" Three hundred million masons. That's insane. Okay, uh, Rory asks if getting a job in the Australian game industry is a realistic goal. Uh, yes. I have taught people who have gone straight into the game industry after graduating. Um, they wanted to have a particular set of skills, they want to build up the right portfolio, but it's 100% possible. Um, so, I taught a cohort of students that finished in 2018, so that was just before I came to UNSW. Um, two of them are currently working for Wargaming, and that's over in Ultimo, um, you know World of Tanks? World of Tanks has the funniest statistic of any computer game where um, I think it's one in four adult Russian males have played that game. <laughs> it's like no one else is at that percentage of a demographic. <laughs> but apparently, <laughs> Russian adult Russian males really love their tanks and have played World of Tanks. And so Wargaming is the company that builds the engine behind that, and they're based in Sydney. So um, I've got a couple of students working there, half a dozen of my friends work there as well and stuff like that so they're a big enough company that there is there is there is a chance to work they have an internship program they've come to CSE before um on recruitment days and things I don't know if they're still doing that regularly um but they will always be looking looking for talent around the place if you're talking about can you um can you break into the indie market that's a completely different thing you need the right people at the right time for that. But the bigger companies definitely are hiring people. Um, I don't know whether you can compare that against how much hiring is going on in the generic tech industry. So I would say that Wargaming is a reasonably big company um, from a gaming perspective, but they're not as big as Atlassian or anything like Atlassian is a very large company. Um, they're probably going to take more people a year than Wargaming is in general, and much more from CSE, because like there's more people in CSE who are not capable of entering the game industry when they finish their degree, because uh, they haven't built up the, the, the right skills for it. Um, okay. Other questions? Uh, Mitch is asking, didn't that game kind of die for a bit? Star Citizen, it hasn't been released. It's been 15 years. It's so weird. But I mean, it's got a lot of pedigree behind it because I think it's um, uh, one of the leads for Wing Commander, which is like one of the classic flight sim games. I didn't talk about flight sims at all, but I mean, like, historically not super relevant. Um, 
early 90s had a lot of flight sims. Uh, Wing Commander, Strike Commander, X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, and all of those. But, anyway. Um, yeah, so Mitch, the game hasn't died, because it hasn't lived. Uh, Michael's saying, what courses should you take if you're interested in game dev and you don't want to be unemployed? Hmm. Not wanting to be unemployed and wanting to be in game dev is an interesting kind of paradox. So you get this in other industries. So we get this in the fashion industry, the music industry, um, all forms of the entertainment industry. The games industry is the same because it is part of the entertainment industry if it's a, if it is a big umbrella. Um, more people want to do it than we need people to do it. So if more people want to do it than we need people to do it, there's a few things that you need to be um, aware of. You have to be better than more people than you have to in the standard computing industry. There's no such thing as a standard computing industry, but everywhere else in the computing industry. Um, so yes, you have to be better than more people than you think that you would normally have to be better than. Uh, the other thing is you have to accept less money than the people around you who are as good as you. So I had a student who... Um, graduated and honestly um like i would have trouble considering myself a better game programmer than this person like i would consider myself a better producer than them or a better designer than them but like in terms of just the raw ability to code and what they were getting hired for i'd say they would pump out stuff in unity faster than i would um easily uh this is the thing, sometimes when you teach too much, your, your raw skills kind of get slower and your students are better than you. But that's fine, that's, that's what it's for. That's, I'm a successful teacher if my students are better than me. Um, they were getting 40k a year in their first graduate job. I'm not going to say where it is because people are just going to look at that company and just go, can we burn that thing to the ground if they're giving grads 40k a year? Because you can flip burgers and get 40k a year. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know what, what, how many hours one would need uh, to do that. But as a full-time programmer, if you were to go to any of the other tech companies or a bank or a consulting firm or something like that, and they put an offer on the table of $40,000 a year, I authorize you to tear that in half and walk out immediately. Right? That is devaluing... Um, what programmers are in, in, in the current industrial sense. Um, so those are the things to watch out for. But in terms of what courses you should take, um, it depends where you want to be in game dev. So if you want to be running and making the games yourself, I think that you need a little bit of psychology you need a little bit of thinking about how to make things for people. I think HCI is a decent one for that. Um, it's not the same, but it is very much about the idea that you're designing for humans um, because games are more than other pieces of software designing for humans. Other pieces of software are designed for a purpose and sometimes need humans to be able to use them well. The entire purpose of the game is to entertain humans and so you need, you need a bit of that there. Um, graphics would be good for some people. That's if you're going to end up in a position where you're actually going to be um, building an engine. Usually, and this is a funny thing about the game industry, is every company that built a game engine, um, rather than using someone else's game engine, um, went under. <laughs> so Epic Games... Uh, who did they get bought out by? I think they had to get they had to get floated by Tencent, or else they were gonna they were gonna close. Id Software had to get bought by Bethesda, or they were gonna close. Um, Unity is one of the few ones that just made an engine but didn't try to make a game, and that's why they were successful because they didn't have to do both things at once. But everyone that's tried to build their own engine and make a game in their own engine has eventually um, either needed funding from outside or closed entirely. I'm thinking of CryEngine, maybe... Oh, wait, no, they got bought by Amazon. Yeah. So none of those companies survived on their own. 
to be able to sell their product as their own. Uh, the Cry Engine is now called Amazon Lumberyard. So, yeah. <laughs> as much as I am teaching computer graphics, you don't 100% need it. Um, certain companies will definitely take you on board because you've got experience with that. Um, one of the funny things about doing stuff like comp graphics and working with OpenGL is if you can do significant stuff with OpenGL, um, you've proven a theoretical knowledge of 3D rendering and stuff like that, which is good. You've also proven that you are capable of coding with one of the most convoluted and annoying APIs in existence, which is the software link between us and graphics cards, which is just, it's kind of hellish. Uh, anyone who's going to be with me in term three next year will go through that hell. Um, hopefully we'll go through that hell in a way where I actually show you how bits of it work as we go along. Um, since asking my thoughts on game prices increasing to $70, keeping in mind that companies like 2K led this initiative. 2K used to have a lot of stuff based in Australia. They used to have a whole, whole thing in Cam in Canberra, actually. Um, when you say game prices increasing to $70, you mean US dollars, right? Because they've been way over $70 for a long time in Australian dollars. Now, let me just, um... Oh, Matthew's asking, why is my username comp1511? I actually was going to change that before this talk. I'm definitely going to change it soon because it's it's going to be just Mark Chi teaching at UNSW because it's not just going to be comp1511. So I'm, I'll change it eventually. Um, at least I think. I don't know if I can change my username. I might have started a new account. Um... Oh, actually, like, just should have the conversation with people who are talking because Rory was saying in the long term would it be better to just go for a software engineering job that will pay more by default with less stress from pressure of unrealistic deadlines perhaps work on games as a hobby I, I would love to say that that's a cool thing to do um, but how many indie games have I released while I have been doing games as a hobby on the side while I've apparently been doing other things <laughs> that many so, if you really want something, I mean, this, is, this is really tough advice to give. If you really want something, then maybe you do need to make sacrifices for it. So, if, if the thing, if the dream you have, the real absolute dream you have, is to work in computer games and to make computer games for people, then decide how much of the rest of your life you're going to sacrifice for that and commit to it and then you'll 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 maybe get there so a lot of you are on a path because you're in CSE a lot of you are on a path towards um making good money in an industry that cares about you um if your dream is computer games and it is 100% definitely what you want to do you've got to give up that so you've got to give up the idea that um, you will get paid more money than everyone else you know, except for the computing people that you know, and you will be treated well by a company that really respects you and wants to, and has an interest in your growth and your mental health. Um, if you decide you want to go into games, you will only rarely get that, um, as opposed to if you're going for a top tier tech company like you're you know, your, your end goal is to get into Google and like, not everyone gets into Google first go, right? You go work in other companies and then you go for, you go for the big shot like that. Um, yeah, they're, they're different industries. Um, so I've seen people working in the games industry, uh, tech in the film industry and stuff, and then normal tech and the friends in normal tech have more time for their families and more money. So it's a tough call, but I do have friends who are in computer games who are very, very happy with what they do. So it's hard to, it's hard to really kind of, you know, I'm, I'm painting really wide, really broad brushstrokes here, and it may not be entirely accurate. Okay, back to other questions that we were talking about. Oh, Sid was talking about price rises. Okay. It's an industry. It's a commercial industry. 
Commercial companies will keep raising the price until people stop buying. Um, I saw a really, really funny thing um, ages ago. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 or 3. I can't remember. One of the, one of the Call of Duties. There was a Steam group called Boycott Call of Duty um, because of something. I don't know. Just, I think they were just whinging about something stupid. I was like, boycott Call of Duty. Uh, a week after release, someone took a screenshot of that Steam group and all the people who are in that Steam group, and 80% of them were, like, playing Call of Duty. It was just written there under their names, and it was just like, yeah, well, okay. So it's not going to happen. I think the price is going to keep going up because we're going to keep buying things. If at any point um, we stop buying things because they're too expensive then the price will level out for a while. It'll never go down. It'll level out for a while, and then it'll go up again once they think that we have the capacity to pay more. So I think that's the only way this is going to happen, and the jump to $70 is just another jump. It's They're always going to keep jumping if they think they can get away with it. Um, I say that from a very cynical perspective because I know that the people setting the price on games are entirely not the same people as the people like putting their dreams into the games i think if you want um those big triple a games to come down in price you need to stop buying them which doesn't make any sense right because we still want them but maybe in you if you choose which ones you can afford and that means you're buying less overall that percentage change in how much you're spending, if everyone does that, is going to be seen by those companies and they will limit their their price rises. I think if you really love games, there are certain places where your money should be going and it's here. It's here. Ah, oh, maybe not this one. They got plenty of money on their own, but these ones, these little ones that are really doing something, um, these little ones, they're not little anymore. This is not little. <laughs> not little anymore but when they start out when you see new ideas that are really cool even if they're not great you just see new ideas that are really cool just sort of throw money their way because all of these are going to be like five dollars each i've bought some games i haven't even played all the games on this list but i've bought all of them i think because sometimes it's like i like the idea of what you're doing have some money when i get around to it i will play your thing but please have the money now when it's important to you because you only just released recently you know that kind of thing but yeah uh, i don't know it's hard it's hard not to be cynical about price um increases but also the price increases are always going to be aligned with what we stomach and i'm not saying what we can stomach i'm saying what we do stomach which is nearly worse um okay other questions Michael saying, please convince them to sponsor us again. You want, you want me to talk to Wargaming for you? <laughs> I mean, I do have a lot of contacts there. Um, but um, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Oh, Mason is saying eight years, not 15 years. <laughs> nah, I think I was just like, it feels, it feels like 15 years. Okay, any other questions? I'm just scrolling through the chat now to catch up. I'm about 10 minutes behind. It's deadly fugu. Let's pay for higher skills. Sounds like the dream. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. The game's interesting. Like, when you consider, like, you could be making accounting software for people to balance the books in their businesses... Or you could be making first-person shooters. It's like, it's it's like, if they were the same job, it'd be really easy to decide which one you were going to do. And because that happened, I know, apologies to anyone who's excited about accounting software, but may I, may I point you back at the title of the talk and why we're all here, because we're excited about computer games. Um, yeah, I think that's the thing. Because the content of the job is more exciting, more people will probably go for it. Um... Okay, let me just see whether other questions. 
Masony flipping burgers is greater than game dev. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a tough thing. Also, some people are making a lot of money flipping burgers because they're making very, very good burgers, but that's not everyone. Someone was talking about Bungie and Valve's. I'm not sure where... I, I think I must have missed that conversation when it happens. Star Citizen runs on CryEngine. Yeah, that's how old it is. It runs on CryEngine still. CryEngine doesn't even... It doesn't even exist as an engine anymore. I mean, like, CryEngine 3, I guess, still exists. But, um... I think it's Amazon Lumberyard now. But I don't even know if anyone's really using Lumberyard. Everyone's on Unreal Engine now. I think it's because Unreal Engine has, like, a really, really nice lighting out of the box. And so you just drop stuff in, and it works really easily. And as Deadly Fugu is saying, graphics as a subject is still useful because you still might do shaders in both Unity and Unreal. So even if most of the engine's already built, you would still want to, to know about shaders and post-processing. Um, Valve games running on Source? Yes. But when was the last Valve game released? Oh, Half-Life Alex. There you go. So they release one game a decade now. <laughs> so I don't think they even... Um... But you're right, you're right. Valve is the one game that built their own engine and um, uh, and didn't need to get bought out by someone else because the weight... Usually it's the weight of effort of building your own game engine um, drives the company to the point where they can't, they can't support themselves. Oh, Rory's asking what game titles did I work on that we could view? Um, wait, my scroll just automatically moved. I can't find your question anymore. Um, I've got games that I supervised that students made, so I don't know if that really counts. Um, but I can show you one of them. I'm going to turn on my audio so you can see it. Um, oh, wow. Where is it? Man, it hasn't been searched for in such a long time. <laughs> I can't even find it. Um, because the only reason they had a video out at all was because we made them make trailers for their games. Hmm. I can't find it. Um, I had a game that I made for a global game jam. That's definitely not going to be around. Oh wow, someone made something else. Um... It was a game about being spies in a city and you would change your clothes so that people didn't know who you were. And then other people had clues to who people were based on the clothes they were wearing and stuff. I, it's really weird that I can't find it. Oh, it's not going to be in my search history on this account. It's going to be in my search history on my personal account. Um, let's switch over for a second. Oh, there it is. So this is a game that I I only supervised. I didn't make it. Like so, I didn't make it to the point where they put my name in it as a cameo. Um, so I'm not even credited. So this isn't really something that I made.
Yeah, so that's um, that's a game that uh, four people worked on for four months, I think, which is kind of astounding that they could get that level of quality in that time. So that's like one of the ones that um, uh, that I took people through like a program where we taught them how to make games and then put them in in groups where they put something like that together. Um, I'm not sure what they're all doing now. Um, I guess it's interesting to say that with that quality of of output and that in their portfolio, they won best student game at the Free Play Indie Games Festival in Melbourne the year after they made that. Um, I don't think any of them got jobs in the game industry straight after that with that in their portfolio. So it's a it's a tough world. Um, I should probably try to find the game that I made in uh, 2010. <laughs> it's the last actually successful like completion of a game. Um, and see if I can get it up and running again. Um, it's going to be hard, but like <laughs> there'll probably be a way. Um... So yeah, that's um, yeah, that's something interesting there. Sam's like, wait, you're still live. Had a full group meeting, then come back. Yeah, yeah, we we just, we're still going. So what are we at? We're at uh, uh, three and a, three and a half hours now, I think. Yeah, and Michelle's saying you'd play it. Yeah, I know people would play it, right? And we tried. Um, we we tried to keep going with it, but everyone was you know because we couldn't necessarily just pull funding in for it I came here to UNSW and I got lumped with a whole bunch of work as well um, and the team went off in different directions and so they're all they're all doing other things now so it didn't quite get finished but I really enjoyed it I thought it was really interesting also the park in the game that they're in is called Chi Park so like that was, that was the thing for me I, uh, I used to um go around while people are making games and try to get them to put me into their games as a cameo for shits and giggles <laughs> yeah anyway so that's an example it's not actually my work it's an example of something I helps help students get to um okay let me look back and see if there are other questions Deadly Fugu is saying, if I think OpenGL is convoluted, check out Vulcan. I haven't looked at Vulcan. I heard, I th I heard Vulcan was supposed to, like, you know, be more modern and, and solve our problems. It was supposed to be, like, the Python to C for, for OpenGL, but obviously it wasn't that, wasn't that different. Um, MX is asking, what kind of companies are like the ones who care about you and pay well? Do you have any examples? So we're we're talking about the, the the general kind of computing industry that's happening at the moment. This is not something that I should necessarily comment on directly. I think this is something that you want to look up. Um, you can look up surveys that have been done by people about major tech companies. Recently, there was one done on whether people are working a thirty-five hour week. Um, whether they would expect to be working on weekends at all and also there was a percentage chance that they would be involved in a performance review so performance review is a way of saying to someone we don't think that you're working up to par we need to review what you've been doing and then it will go deep into the work that you do and pick at it so it's it's usually like psychologically it's not a nice thing to have to go through um, it's used as a political weapon in some companies to like reduce the reputation of other people in the company and stuff like that so um it's awkward i mean like a lot of the time the idea of it is like you, you're using it so that you can um uh um what's we call it you can um you can make sure that everyone's actually working properly and no one's freeloading on what you're doing so there is a use for it but like it's been weaponized in certain certain companies um, yeah, so I think I think you want to look up actual information rather than me 
just firing off names of companies because I think that's not a good thing for me to do <laughs> necessarily. Um, a deadly figure was saying that maybe prices going up is a better situation for the devs. There's my response to that statement. <laughs> I'm a little cynical, and so is Chicken. She nearly tried to run away then, just at the end, as I was, as I was grabbing her. I think she wants me to go and feed her. This is that afternoon time where she wants food. Um, Karen's saying that PS5 games are $124. My god. That is, um, that's full on. And Dean's asking if you can get premium ships or World of Warships. I don't think I can do that. I don't, I don't ask my friends in those companies for anything because I know that you don't, you don't get anything. They don't, they don't give anything. I've got a friend who works for Sony and I was like, give me a PlayStation. He's like, dude, I can get you a TV for like 30% off the ticket price, but I cannot get a single dollar off a PlayStation. I'm just like, wow, that's locked down. Um... Matthew was asking about <laughs> he's using cancer as an adjective. <laughs> how bad how bad working in the uh, working in Japan the gaming industry is. I don't know. Um, I hear that you're expected to have a level of dedication that us um, us in the Western world don't understand. Um, that's all I've heard of it though. I don't have any friends who um, are currently working there. I have one friend who did work there. And he said it was really, really full on. Um, so he, he survived it for a year or two. And he's like, ah, I'm going back to Australia, you know. So I think if you're committed, it's fine. If you if it's your life, it's sort of okay. Um, but it will consume it in a certain way. So that would be a choice. Oh, so Sinio is saying, like, there's more detail about Crytek. They didn't necessarily get bored out. They didn't necessarily go under or anything. They actually kind of had Lumbee, uh, like, the CryEngine was purchased from them to make Lumbee Yard. So it's maybe a, 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 po a possibly better situation for them. <laughs> Monty's asked, who's my favorite sci-fi character? This is such a big call. I mean, like, it depends if... How did that happen? Did you do that? Sorry. Chicken sitting on my mouse, so... She may have just been flicking through the slides there. Um, oh, favorite sci-fi character. This is hard. I would have to spend more time thinking about this. But off the top of my head, it might be Jim Holden from The Expanse. <laughs> He's a funny, funny character. Um, but maybe even more so Miller. Uh, Miller from The Expanse, which is where my haircut comes from. So, this this haircut is based on Miller's haircut um, in the second season of The Expanse. Um, but I, I do like that, because I, I just like the, the vision of the future in The Expanse. But you could also go to a different vision of the future and say someone like Jean-Luc Picard is like one of my favourite sci-fi characters as well. Um, I think that's a really funny question, because like, there's such a can of worms. Um, all right. So, what were we talking about? People were talking about the game that I showed. Um, Ian is saying, in terms of the future of gaming, perhaps we expect Scent to come along. Uh, digital Scent technology. I... I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's going to happen. I have seen some really, really funny things that people got up to. Um, trying to do ambience so they would have these things that have lights around you and fans and they would turn those fans on and turn the lights to different colors based on what was on your screen I think it was uh, launched alongside Far Cry 2 and then just disappeared because <laughs> no one got that deep into it I mean the closest you're gonna get is people putting subwoofers in their chairs you know to try to get that closer immersiveness but it's interesting how amazing we are at recreating audio and recreating video so that we can see it and believe it but smell is something we just cannot do synthesizing taste is something we're not very good at either so it's interesting to see if that tech will ever happen 
So Ian, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I'm going to agree with you that scent technology will necessarily happen. Um, Shrey is saying you have to head off. Yeah, no worries, Shrey. I can I can handle chat. It looks like um, we haven't accidentally gone viral with this stream like I did with one of my lectures uh, earlier in the year. Hello. I'm being patted by a cat. It's this is the topsy turvy world we live in now. Um, okay, so I think um, the uh, the Q and A is sort of wrapping up there. <laughs> Michelle saying, if sp fart spray is a thing, I'm sure sooner or later other sprays can become a possibility. Yes, but when we think about it. On our monitors, there's only three colors. There's red, green, and blue at different levels of intensity. And with that, we can, we can do a simulation of anything that we can see. If we could find, say, the three, col the three colors, <laughs> the three smells that could be combined in different amounts so that we could smell anything, then we could think we could genuinely synthesize it. Or like sound, um, it's like we can sample a wave of vibration in certain ways and if we play back those specific samples of wave vibration 44,000 times a second that's the um, the standard uh, number of hertz for creating a waveform we can recreate any sound with a set of speakers I think that's the thing that we don't have for smell at the moment we could recreate certain specific smells but we haven't been able to break it down into parts where we could just adjust the ratios and then create any possible smell that would be the thing that would be, um, uh, that, that would get us to that point. Um, Ian's saying more like 400 to a thousand smells. So the, the, the fundamental aspects of smell, there's, there's kind of more of them, which is probably why our tech has never reached that point. Also, cause we're not necessarily smell oriented creatures. Like we are a little bit, but not that much. So we've never really learnt. uh, we've never really like felt the need to have our tech give us smell. Sinio is like, don't want to play a horror game with smell emulation. Fair enough. And Sam's saying this is the million dollar idea time. Wait, Sam, are you about to give us a million dollar idea or are you talking about the smell thing? Oh, Deadly Fugu is saying games for dogs. There's totally games for pets on, on iPad and stuff like that. Like, this cat does not care at all about them but like you have the ipad things where a fish swims along and when you tap on it, it it goes away and then another one comes along and so like made for your cat to actually play on an ipad but i don't think um this cat has never cared about them <laughs> a dog that did a hadouken no i don't know That's some interesting stuff Ian's talking about there, about um, w how we're even psychologically equipped to handle smells. Like, for us to see something, our internal model of the 3D representation of the world is so well built that we can instantly understand things as they move around, even if they we've never seen something like that or they don't even exist. Um, but whether we can actually understand stuff that we smell is something else. So, interesting. A cat playing Fruit Ninja, yeah. That makes so much sense. <laughs> I wonder if I should stream some gaming sometime. That would be pretty funny. What have I got? On my list of things that I'm playing at the moment, um, I've been playing some Star Wars Squadrons, just because I'm an old school flight sim kind of person. I've been playing uh, Deep Rock Galactic, with a couple of friends just because we like co-op games as a, as a, as, a few, as a bunch of friends um solo i was playing some halo and stuff you know you know i'm like one button press away from being able to do this <laughs> let's see what i've got going at the moment uh, Dean's asking about War Thunder. I don't actually know anything about War Thunder. I've not played it. I have a friend that plays it all the time. Oh, you know the downside of me doing this now is everyone's going to see what my uh, Steam username is. I'm not just going to friend you randomly, okay? Like, 
I'm not going to. <laughs> so, so don't bother. Um, there is, especially if I'm currently your lecturer, there's a significant important distinction between uh, lecturer and students. I'm not, I'm not going to friend people. Okay. No, 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 don't add me on Steam, it's not going to happen. Let's play something super old school and great. Oh, someone said Jet Set Radio. Yeah, oh, wow, you see my favourite. So this is like my list of things at the moment that I'm sort of looking into or haven't finished playing or anything like that. Um, okay. I'm not going to do this for that long. Let's just say, like, half an hour or something like that. But I am literally going to stream some gaming. And I think Halo would be a fun one to do because I talked a lot about Halo and I've got, like, the Master Chief collection here. Oh wait, you want to see hours in games? What's um the way to view um sort by hours played? Oh, Warframe. Actually, that's not as much as I thought. There's like five hundred hours in Warframe. Someone said, "Why is Alien Swarm installed?" Alien Swarm is a classic co-op game. It's really good. Nah, this is not. This is not where you'll see the thousands of hours from me. If you wanna, you wanna find thousands of hours from me. Oh, it doesn't even matter. My account is not active with World of Warcraft at the moment, but if I opened World of Warcraft and showed you the days played on my characters, then then we have we have we have bad things happening. Okay, let's fire up Halo. Mm, yeah. And I've got my game audio coming through to you as well. This is definitely the funniest thing that I've done in a while. I finally hit the big time. I'm a game streamer. Yeah, the Halo theme music. How good is it? Do 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 do. Do 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 do. And then when, I think it's Halo Two when they got Van Halen in, and they're like they're those ripping guitar lines over the top. Like I remember when we were playing that, we were just like all got so excited when that happened. I don't know how loud that is. It feels like it might be loud. Oh, one other thing I forgot. I have my fans on silent when I'm streaming so they don't in like don't cause problems for the, the microphone, but now I'm gonna have to fire them up if I'm rolling running 3D. Having said that, the campaign that I'm up to is Halo 1, so it's not going to be taxing my graphics card very much. Alright. I'm just gonna resume where I'm up to. And let's see, and now everyone can judge me on my first person shooter skills that I'm trying to do while I have a cat sitting in my mouse pad. I just move her off the mouse pad and she goes straight back onto it. Okay, if my aim is bad I'm blaming chicken and no one can ever think bad of chicken so it's fine. Yeah, Michael, I 100% agree that Bungie had an instinct for first person shooters. Not an instinct, I think it was trained. <laughs> They really knew what they were doing with first-person shooters. Okay. Lots of ammo. If I remember correctly, I need to get up there, which I think is over this bridge. Warning. I detected multiple Covenant dropships on approach. I recommend moving into those hills. If we're lucky, the Covenant will believe that everyone aboard this light will like died in a crash. Pressing shift. Alert! Sprint Covenant right dropship inbound. <laughs> And you nothing's must be happening looking for survivors. This is a generation of first person shooters before that. And you're gonna have to watch out for those banshees, because they're probably gonna come from. Oh, yep, yep. I think it's seen me. Has it? Yep. Oh, no, maybe not. We'll see, because I'm pretty sure my assault rifle is not going to do enough damage to be relevant against the Banshee. Oh, it's definitely shooting. Yeah, I can convince it to turn away at least. Uh, hello little friends. Let's you and me have a chat. Yeah, 
with, and we have some grenades now. Oh, I missed it. I think I was um, playing very much more like I was playing with um, when I was playing Reach, where you, I think you can be a bit more aggressive in Reach, whereas this one, once you start losing health, you've really got to back off. Um, but I went one-on-one -on -one with that Elite when I probably shouldn't have. Or at least have cleared out the, uh, the Grunts before I took it on. I wonder how Reading many. Reading a light um, beacon over the next hill. How many of my should check to see if there are any survivors. It's like, oh, I've got to be really, really good now. Oh, there are humans here. So, so. You'll notice when I do this. Also, need luck. King of new cannons. That's how you take it. The, the Niggler does so much damage and aims itself. It's just like, <laughs> it's so easy until they dodge. You know, I was we'll actually see, just in, back 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 Over here. in the roundhouse at an Xbox launch party that they, they they did in the roundhouse that was um showing off Halo for the first time. I remember being there with a friend of mine just going, it's not the works, first person shooter and all sorts of stuff. And then we kind of went to the We loved it so much. I was like, I fought until my shields ran out, and I don't have any health right now. This is the old Halo didn't have regenerating health. Oh, someone said the sound's a bit loud. Your help, sir. Back me up. I will. Hang on a second. I think I need to just drop the volume here. I'm gonna look around because I know that this there's a bunch of humans up here, which means there might be a health pack somewhere. Before I go and get in another fight and die again. I'm not seeing anything though. There they are. Alright, good. Less likely to just die immediately this time. Also, I'm pretty sure I got needled the way that I'm needling this guy. That is the most satisfying thing. That's the most satisfying. <laughs> when you're like, they're nearly dead, I could keep shooting them, or I could give them the rifle butt, and, and that's just so much fun. They just said something, but I didn't hear it. Maybe that there was another dropship coming in. So, oh, so close. If you can stick him, perfect. Oh, I think I still killed him, because he didn't notice. There's something really pure 
about Halo. It's just so simple. You've only got two weapons you can carry at a time. You just pick up whatever. Any weapon that that the enemy can use, you can use as well. So it's just you just run around and like you don't care about ammo. You just burn the ammo and the weapons that you've got. And then if it comes down to it, you just pick up whatever's around. This is quite funny. <laughs> Tom's like, have I quit and used my fame to start a streaming channel? <laughs> uh, that music makes me feel like something serious is happening. I should get back around the front again. Let's see, there we go. See you later, Ian. Thanks for coming along. I mean, we're obviously, the talk's obviously over by now. <laughs> See you all. Mickey Mouse is asking you if this is the industry mentoring session. Um, we could consider this to be some industry mentoring. We're talking about the game that she knows now. <laughs> Sid, see you soon. Thanks for coming along. And Karate, karate maybe? Um, thank you, thank you for coming. Well, obviously, like, uh, now degenerating into just me playing games. And as Dean's saying, yeah, the sound design is amazing. I still keep pressing shift to run. The music's still going, and I thought I already taken everyone out. I don't know. Oh wait, there they are. There's a whole bunch of them over there that I just forgot were there. I was that close to that. Whoa. Next time, if I see a bunch of enemies that don't know I'm there yet, I should throw the grenade first.
I'm on my way. Look, more lifeboats. Over there. They're coming in I'm fast. On this side. Wait, where are you going? If those lifeboats make it down, I'm going to be right on top of them. Phone hammer, we need you to disengage your warthog. The Master Chief and I are going to see if we can save some soldiers. Roger, Cortana. That music, so good. I'm trying to think about where I'm going. I think I'm going down to this valley. I wasn't listening to the to the speech, so I don't know where I'm headed. This cave is not a natural formation. Someone built it, so it must lead somewhere. I've hacked into the Covenant battle map. Broadcasting tactical data on unencrypted channels. We should show them who they're dealing with. Master Chief, I'm going to use your suit's transcom system to monitor their chatter. Did everyone just flash F when I died then? <laughs> I have a feeling that like, that little thing that I just went through there... Oh right, it was gonna block me with that. I feel like there was a secret down there, because there was this yellow light down there, but I didn't bother looking for it. I know they've added a lot of random little sort of easter eggs and collectibles into this, but it's not super important, not part of the original game. I'm just here for the story. And for... Oh, running away. Oh, yep, no. And you... Oh! Hey! Not this time. It would be more efficient to get out and shoot them, but it's just not the same level of fun. Which probably wouldn't have happened if I'd gone now. Because that was At least the guy in my turret's got a good aim. It's better than me. I actually don't need to do that. I'm just going to move. did need to do that. There's somewhere where I need to press a button to extend that bridge, I think. Woo, gotta stay on it though. <laughs> stay on okay, let's hop out. Can't remember exactly where it is. I mean, like, also it has been a very long time since I last played this. Oh, the Aussie Marines, yeah, I know, that was always, always really funny. Okay, here's the bridge controls. Who was 
old graphics, it's so funny. What is the chicken? Stop playing games and feed me! <laughs> Alright, we're not gonna play for very much longer. But, um... Let's just get to... Next checkpoint. You've already seen your lecturer playing Halo and you can judge me on my target acquisition skills and obviously you can judge me on using a needler instead of a gun that you actually need skill to use. I think the needler was a little bit OP in this game, it was just like... Um, but also, you can kind of see how this was made for console at a point where people couldn't... Like, the control pads weren't even that accurate at the time, so like, you look at the reticle on my assault rifle, it's this giant thing, and it's just really forgiving whenever you're just near enough to hit. It nearly feels like a little bit, a little bit cheating to be able to do it with a um, with a mouse and keyboard nowadays. And There's new traffic on the Tugman's battle now. A lot more crew made it off the autumn than I had predicted. The captain really gave them hell. We can find Captain Keys and the other survivors. We have a chance to coordinate an effective resistance. Oh, finding Captain Keys. You don't remember the story? <laughs> I won't say anymore. We're definitely not going to get there either. I'll wrap this up pretty soon. I wonder if it's okay for me to be streaming Halo on YouTube. I don't know what like copyright stuff there is. I assume it's okay, people are streaming games like all the time. get into a lot of in-depth discussions about game design that talk about how you convince people to go where you need them to go while still giving them the belief, belief that they're um... So I get talking about design while I'm just a firefight. Um, while giving them the idea that they're in full control of making decisions, but what you're really doing is making sure they stay on track. Jumping's pretty funny. It's very floaty. Not quite used to it. Where are we going? I thought that they said that there were people in the side here. Don't really know where the door is. See, 
Does anyone else ever get this? Like, you play games and then you always get in the passenger seat because you live in Australia and our cars <laughs> are at a different angle. Oh, sorry, not a different angle, but like a different time. We drive on the other side. Oh, they're up there. Yeah. I'm not afraid of I'll call in a drop ship to pick them up. What? Anyone want to hop in? Yeah, I thought someone would hop in. Alright. Where are we going? The safest thing to do is actually just sort of stand still somewhere and let the gunner in the back deal with We read you, Echo 419. We have survivors and need immediate dust off. Roger, Cortana. On my way. Okay. I've spotted additional lifeboats in your area. One near a rock slide. And another near the cliff edge. Hard to see from my altitude, but it looks like there are more survivors. Acknowledged. We're on our way. Assume there's one in there, just because there's lights. Over here. Try that on. What do streamers do? Should I be talking about random things? Quite hard to talk and drive at the same time. Come on. <laughs> People are judging this level because it's a whole series of like basically fetch quests. Go to this place, clear this building of exactly the same stuff. I guess there is a bit of um the difference between design of the older versus the new. Let's um hop out. Actually, I should probably just wrap it up now. It's like 6 p.m. We've been going for like four hours. Um, let's just listen to that for a moment. See, that's like, you know what I was talking about cinematic shooters? This kind of cinematic feel in the games. Pretty amazing. Um... What was I going to say? I think, uh, like, one of my, um, I, I think, like, a lot of the, like, sort of team dynamic and the, the speed and the drama of the things in, um, in Halo Reach is really good. Um, there's also a lot of really good stuff in Destiny as well. Like, Destiny 2 on PC is still pretty good. It's a bit grindy, because it's more RPG than shooter, but there's a lot of shooter stuff in it, which feels really good. Um, yeah, let's, um, let's hop out for now. I'm about to wrap up the stream. Uh, Donald's asking if I watch Game Maker's Toolkit. It rings a bell, but I, I don't. Um, I don't watch it. And maybe I've heard of it at some point. Okay, <laughs> I love it. I, the number of the, the number of people viewing has just gone up. It went down a bit when I stopped talking. <laughs> I was playing Halo. It's gone back up again. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Um, let's wrap it up there. Thank you all for coming along to my brief history of video games. Um, 
You know what I should do, which would be really, really funny, is do a talk on the history of video games and actually play a whole bunch of them on stream. I think that would be really interesting to, to, to show each of the games and say what in the actual gameplay was interesting in them. So I could turn this thing from a three-hour thing into, like, an eight-hour thing like that, I think. <laughs> um, Strawberry, you're welcome. Um, glad you enjoyed it. Oh, Cliff, how's it going? Speaking of non-electronic games, yes, maybe at some point I'll talk about uh, something that's nothing to do with computers, but I do a lot, which is board gaming, tabletop gaming, and stuff like that. Uh, Cliff is in one of the groups that I, that I play those games in. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming along, everyone. Um, <laughs> and people are saying hopefully we can play some more in the future. Um, I think I need to turn up to some of your Among Us sessions <laughs> and play along. <laughs> I think there's nothing funnier than having a lecturer come along and, um, uh, and, and come along and just come into Among Us and go, kick that person off or I'm failing you out of all of your subjects. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> just a, like total abuse of power to try to win the game. Um, Michael saying, why did you stop playing Halo? Four hours long is a record for a workshop. Are we four hours? Oh, we are four hours. Yeah. Cliff, did you say what is Among Us? That's, a. Uh, I don't know if you're joking or you just haven't noticed. Among Us is, like, the biggest game at the moment that everyone is playing. Uh, it's, um, yeah, there is one lecturer on Among Us. Yeah. <laughs> You've been in a cave, yeah, yeah, since COVID, this game has gotten really famous. It's been around for a couple of years, but it got really famous. It's like a hit and roll, um, backstabby kind of game. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and it'll make you angry if you play against random people. Dean, hello. Yes, you missed most of the stream. I actually played some Halo on the stream. Um, I think it would be really funny, actually, if um, I play games on stream and then people actually join me in game. Uh, we need to figure out what kind of games we can play that actually um, have enough slots for a lot of people to play. Like Halo wouldn't be that great because only one person um, could play co-op. Um, I'm trying to think of um, interesting games like that. I, I had a thought, a really, really funny thing that I could do that would be super silly is start like a World of Warcraft guild and then I will be your guild leader and then all the students join my World of Warcraft guild and then play with me because I think it's really funny because like a lot of the times in guilds you've got these like really awkward kind of uh, leadership issues but if I'm in the guild with you then obviously I just take leadership and I don't allow anyone else to have it it's like go my minions kill that thing for me <laughs> they don't even have 40 person raids I think you need up to 25 now Oh, Gira-chan just got out of your lonely CS paint corner. Wait, was that just due? Or is it due late? No, no, it's not Sunday. It's not Sunday. It's Thursday. <laughs> but hi, Gira-chan. Um, I'm actually just about to... Um, um, just about to wrap up the stream. Because we talked about computer games for several hours. Lots of good conversation in there and stuff. And then just for, for, for the fun of it, um, people are asking me about if I'd ever play games on stream, so I just played Halo for half an hour. But, at some point I will do some more streaming, maybe I'll do some more, like, just chill stream, where we'd actually just hang out, and stuff like that, and it's not nearly a talk or a workshop, but we just, just hang out, because sometimes it's fun to hang out. Alright, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Thank you for coming along, everyone. Um, Michael's like, how did one hour become three hours, but you, don't you know me by now? I think if, if left unchecked, I can talk a great amount about small things. Actually, it'd be pretty funny to do a Minecraft stream because, like, I don't do Minecraft. Like, I don't know Minecraft at all. Um, so it'd be really funny. It's like, I go into the Minecraft stream and then everyone has to defend me or the lecturer dies on stream, which is also funny. I mean, it's not like I didn't die, like, half a dozen times in Halo just then. Um, yeah, Michael, like, a Minecraft stream with creatives so that we all just go in there and do whatever. Um, but I think it would be really funny because we could do something like, let's come up with a plan to actually implement something in Minecraft, like one of those self-programming kind of things and something that implements a, an algorithm that we actually come up with and we go, okay, how do we actually build this stuff? I think it'd be cool because we'd be doing programming stuff, but we'd also just be like stuffing around in a game, which is nice. Anyway, 
I'm gonna head off. Yes, officially looking at the timer on my stream. It's been four hours and ten minutes, so I think that's enough. <laughs> Thanks all for coming along, and I will see you in the next stream. Actually, for one five one one students, that's tomorrow. We've got an optional stream tomorrow at eleven a.m. All right, see you all.